Um, uh, good morning. Um, sorry for that slightly delayed start. Uh, welcome to this, the first meeting of 2013. And can I, on behalf of the committee, wish you all a happy new year and good fortune for 2013? Can I request and make the usual request that all mobile phones and, and, and devices are switched off because it interferes with broadcasting? And we'll move swiftly on to agenda item one. And our first session is to hear some oral evidence from the committee's languages inquiry from Scottish Government Languages Working Group. And uh, can I welcome today Simon Macaulay, who is the chair, and Gillian Campbell Tau, yeah, Tau, yeah, okay, the cultural organisations and local authority advisors representative, of Scottish Government's Languages Working Group. Um, I believe uh, if you got a brief opening statement, or are we, yep, 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 on you go. We should brief opening statement. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting us. Um, we would very much welcome the inquiry by the European and External Relations Committee and the extensive nature of the inquiry. Uh, and we also hope that through the discussions which are about to take place, this will give further Im impetus to what we see as a very important agenda indeed. Uh, we are here as representatives of the, the working group on One Plus Two Languages, and we recognised from the outset the importance of the remit which was set us by the Scottish Government. We were unanimous in our recommendations, and we have welcomed the positive response of ministers to the 35 recommendations in the report. And we're now very anxious to see the process of implementation get underway. The origin of the, um, the group and the recommendations of the report are the European Union, the Barcelona Agreement of 2002, and the manifesto um, of the current Scottish Government in the 2011 election um, sets out um, uh, uh, recommendations on one plus two languages. That's um, mother tongue plus two additional mm -hmm. languages. It's important to state that it's not English plus two additional languages. Uh, I was privileged to be invited to be chair of the, of the group. Um, you've seen, I think, from your notes, my own career background. I think it's worth saying that I do have a background in modern languages. I remain a qualified and general teaching council registered teacher of French. And through the years, I've sought to, to learn other languages. I'm currently learning Mandarin. The, Members of the working group are representative stakeholders around the language learning agenda. That includes um, Gillian, who represents the uh, cultural organisations and local authorities, and also um, Glasgow City Council. We started our work in the autumn of 2011. We reported in the spring of 2012. There was a subsequent debate in the Parliament. The minister responded to the uh, report in the autumn, and there was a major conference in November. Uh, the work of the working group really had, um, I think, three key drivers. Uh, first of all, the decline of the number of pupils gaining certification um, in all languages, really, with the exception of, of Spanish. The second driver is an economic imperative. The evidence from the research that the working group itself commissioned indicated that it would be something like a 500 million loss to the Scottish economy if Scots are unable to engage with foreign business. And this work and our research has been complemented by work elsewhere on issues of employability of Scots in the future um, if they are unable to speak languages other than, than English. The third driver really is, to quote the first sentence in the report, um, language learning is life enhancing, uh, a concern that Scotland would be left behind and also to nail the myth that all the world speaks English, you don't need to speak an additional language. The reality is that 75% of the world's population doesn't speak English. We recognise that the focus of the inquiry is on primary schools and it's important to say the working group it, itself um, saw the one plus two policy um, within the context of a three to 18 curriculum. In other words, all the way from nursery school through to senior secondary, articulating with curriculum for excellence, linking through to further and higher education. Also, we note that the inquiry uh, refers and is titled to foreign languages. Um, the one plus two report also covers languages which are native to Scotland, both Gaelic and, and Scots. There are 35 recommendations in the report. 
Um, and if I may, I would just want to refer briefly to, to six. The number one, which is perhaps the most important one of all, is access to the first additional language starting from primary, primary one. Quite a change from um, practice in, in most um, schools, most primary schools at the moment. Recommendation four is about the introduction of a second additional language, and the recommendation is that that should be no later than primary five. Uh, recommendation eight covers the transition from primary to secondary, by a big issue and a big problem in the past um, facing um, most um, secondary schools and pupils going into secondary school. So what the group wanted to do was to create the momentum which means that pupils are well equipped to take forward language learning through the secondary school to certificate level and beyond. Recommendation 20 um, recommends that primary uh, school, um, future primary school teachers should have a, a languages qualification at higher level. In other words, the future primary school teachers should be equipped to support the learning of pupils learning languages all the way through primary school. And finally, I just want to mention the two recommendations, 30 and 31, which talk about the important role of foreign language assistants and other native speakers of, of additional languages to support the work of teachers. We were delighted with Scottish Government response to the report. No recommendations were rejected. Where there is partial acceptance, it is about recognising the role of other bodies, such as the General Teaching Council, Scottish Qualifications Authority, universities, local authorities, and schools themselves. There was, as I said, unanimity within the working group, a real determination that the recommendations should be taken forward, but this was very much tempered with realism. There is a financial cost, although the, the period of implementation is um, over the lifetime of two parliaments, which takes us effectively till 2020 or thereabouts. Uh, there has been initial funding um, since the publication of the report to support a number of, of pilots through a financial commitment of four million pounds um, to support these pilots. And we see that as a sign of commitment by the Scottish Government to take this forward. The group's very well aware also of initiatives in um, other initiatives in the past in modern languages themselves, which have been of, of value and have taken the languages agenda forward, but many of which have effectively fallen by the wayside for one reason or another. The uh, group's very determined that this should not happen this time. So we look forward now to hearing more details of the process of implementation, which we expect um, to hear from Scottish Government um, soon. Uh, and central to that process of implementation is winning hearts and minds, uh, pupils, parents, teachers indeed, that the one plus two <coughs> policy must be pursued. Gillian played an invaluable role in the working group and she can say something of the perspective of the two really very important key hold, uh, stakeholder bodies in implementations, local authorities, cultural organisations. If you will permit me um, five minutes uh, just to give you a brief uh, update. Uh, Koala is the Cultural Organisation's Local Authority Advisors for Modern Languages, which is an organisation, cuddly though may it sound, um, meets three times a year to discuss the, the, the pattern and the, and the challenges that languages currently present for Scottish teachers and learners. And that's, it consists of local authority advisors, quality improvement officers and curriculum leaders, as well as representatives from most of the cultural language learning organisations that are based here in Scotland. Um, I was privileged enough to represent them and also to, to represent Glasgow City Council Education Services as um, in my role as um, manager and curriculum leader for Modern Languages 318. Um, Koala played a fairly important role um, in taking on the views of all of the teachers across Scotland and that has therefore had an influence on the policy. Um, you can see that the, the recommendations that have been made um, will have an impact in the way that local policy is shaped. Um, local policies and committee papers will be shaped by local circumstances um, and these will be supported by cultural institutions in terms of training materials and further support to teaching and learning. Consultation has also taken place with practitioners in local establishments and this is something that each authority will be taking um, into account when they are looking at forming their own committee papers um, and also taking into account consultation with further education universities and as Simon said it's very much a 3 to 18 paper and beyond. 
Um, you can see the recommendations that have been made start from directorate level, from directorate and workforce planning, and looking at increased engagement and work with parents as well as other interested stakeholders at local circumstances, and also looking at transition not just at the key point of primary to secondary, but also looking at transition from early years to primary and then secondary and beyond. Okay, thank you very much. Very uh, comprehensive. Um, I'm going to just open uh, with uh, a, a couple of quick questions from uh, both presentations there. Hanzan, Hazal and I, just before Christmas, had the great privilege of launching this inquiry at Domarnock Primary School in Glasgow, um, which was a return for me because that was the social work area that I used to work in. So it was quite interesting going back to see how, how well it developed and how great the school was doing as well. Um, there was The classroom we were in, there was 14 different languages spoken because of the number of kids from uh, across uh, different, different areas across the world who who used a lot of their um, peer education to, to, to teach the other children, there's young kids there who say they were going to the, the Russian club after school. We also have the privilege of meeting some of the parents that are involved, and they are now coming into after school um, uh, clubs as well to get involved so that they can learn the language because they were having their five, six, seven year olds coming home and speaking to them French and Spanish and, and they wanted to understand that and, and, and uh, learn that. Now, you'll understand maybe from the east end of Glasgow, you know, seeing that type of interaction from parents, kids and teachers was absolutely fantastic. So I would maybe want some of your comment on that. I know that we are focus, focusing on primary uh, uh, education right now because I think one of the recommendations from your report was to get in early and teach kids early and that's what we want to look at, how early we should do that. The other, the other uh, point I wanted to bring up was about leadership. Now the head teacher of that school seemed to be very dynamic. Um, Hansella did press her very, very uh, strongly on funding and how much money do you need and is there enough money and are we doing this right? Is it funded properly? And she says, well, really all I need is a wee bit of money at the beginning. And she says, then I used all the skills and all the, the, the experience that we had. So maybe some of your comments on that and how you would see, you know, developing that leadership role with head teachers, because I think that school was really dynamic because they did that, the dynamic head teacher. So we, what support would maybe be there for head teachers to ensure that they develop those leadership skills and take forward um, the, you know, the best parts of, of the working group's recommendations? Perhaps we could start on that convener, but I'm going to ask um, Julian perhaps comment in, in greater detail because she works on the ground within the within Glasgow as the largest um, authority. Um, yes, I mean, I've, I've seen the, um, the report of the meeting in Dalmarnock, and that's clearly very good practice within with, within one school. There's a lot of tremendous practice within primary schools up and down the, the country. I've visited um, a number of schools um, when. As convener of the group, I was visiting both primary and, and secondary schools, and a real determination um, to instil a love of languages and, and to seek to create um, uh, continuity and progression with, within languages. That, however, is not universally the, the, the case. Not, not um, every school in Scotland is practice as well developed as the school that, that, that you have seen. Um, and that is something that we really um, want to address. We want to see, in a sense, an equality agenda so that every child in Scotland has the opportunity to learn from uh, language um, um, de de development with, within schools. Um, and we also want to address some of the, the very real um, issues that have arisen, issues of progression, that there may be very good practice within one class. That doesn't mean when the pupil progresses to the next class that this practice is, is maintained or sustained. And the even bigger issue of transition to secondary school, which I think is a, is a, core, pra uh, um, a core issue. Um, and yes, and the issue of leadership within schools, I think that's absolutely correct. The role of the, of the head teacher in both supporting the, the work of the school, driving forward the work of the, the school, uh, and also ensuring that there are resources that can support the, the work of the school in taking this forward. Uh, Gillian has seen much more practice and may want to, to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the, the, uh, the points that you made there was about parents and about how to engage them. And I think underpinning the whole of the, the recommendations from the report is winning hearts and minds. It's about demystifying what it is to, to learn a foreign language. And the principles of curriculum for excellence in the, the, the overarching statements about celebrating what's special and different about my own language and other language and other cultures. And I think we do have um, a, a huge task, not, not something that we can't overtake, but a huge task in 
you know, selling languages and saying to people that it really does matter. One of the big things I think which is really important, and certainly I can only speak for the, 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 the position that we're moving forward with in Glasgow, is to engage with parents because, as you know, it's mother tongue plus two foreign languages and therefore we really must make use of the resources that we have. I mean, one of the challenges we have is, is having registered GTC teachers who can teach these languages. So therefore, by engaging with parents, and some of the examples that you've seen is where parents come in and they work with children, not only their own children to enhance mother tongue provision, but also to engage with other children and other teachers and learners so they can learn about a different culture, they can learn the language as well. So I think one of the things is definitely bringing parents into that. We have to demystify languages and we have to demystify the whole process of learning a language. I think also as well, it's a, it's a, it's a a really good point about leadership from, from head teachers. You've seen the most wonderful example in Nancy Clooney in Dunmarnock, um, who is a who's a very competent linguist herself, but has also made it very accessible not only to her pupils but to her staff. We're in challenging times where uh, teachers do feel there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of changes that are happening, but if we can show that in a manageable way, the way that they're doing it in Dunmarnock is manageable because they're using existing resources, as you quite rightly pointed out, and that's the way that certainly Glasgow would like to move forward in doing that. And I think it's an example we would like to say and like to show that we could work with other authorities to say if you keep it manageable the danger is that you suddenly start feeling you have to provide 15 different languages and everyone has to get to a fluency rate if we're looking at its exposure to L3 as well as doing L2 and that has to be done um, I think it's a very valid point and something we would want to build on would be peer education children learn really well from each other and of course using the principles of assessment as for learning and also collaborative learning then children will progress if they have the chance and the conditions are created properly properly for them to learn. Um, I would also say that in terms of bringing through L3 and L2, looking at CLIL, which is contextualised learning in the language, if you can use a small bit of a foreign language every day, rather than the traditional way it's been done in primary for a long time, which, you know, an hour a week, and then it doesn't get picked up again. If we can work with people to a manageable level of training and competency, that the teachers feel confident in doing it, it's the same for any other aspect of the curriculum, then I think we're at a really good base um, to work forward with. But I think one of the, the, the recommendations that has been made in the paper is about looking at an audit of current provision and authorities and then moving from that position there. So to look who's trained, what languages are there and how can you enhance that further. And I think we would have to work with very closely with head teachers to say, what do you currently have? We have to look at workforce planning and also to look at what's manageable on a local level. Just segued straight into the, the question I was going to ask you was, is the working group taking on the role of the audit of ensuring that, or, you know, just mapping what, what provisions there, what's available, what skills are there, what parents can, can do what? We had the primary one class that we went, went into, we, it was a, a, pa a parent who's Spanish, who for years now has been teaching Spanish, and, and it was with primary ones, and she was, she was absolutely fantastic, she was so engaging in the class, and they were so motivated, these wee kids to get involved, they were all wanting, you know, the, their chance. And so that audit, I think, is very, very important, because you need to map what, you know, what you've got, basically, and then how you can utilise that. So is that something the working group would be undertaking? If there is a specific recommendation within the report about carrying out an audit within local authorities about um, what is available. There are, for example, a number of, uh, quite a large number, we believe, of, of um, primary teachers who are qualified in modern languages through the Modern Languages and Primary School programme who are, who are not teaching modern languages at, at the moment. Um, and that is the, the, the kind of area that we're, we're we're seeking should be um, identified within within an audit, the, the kind of audit that, that you describe. In terms of, of bringing other people into to the classroom who, who are um, native speakers of language, that, um, I think I mentioned briefly at the outset, is something that we do see very important future. There is practice that's developing now. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is on a, on a, on a large scale, mm -hmm. but that is a very important way of supporting the classroom teacher. And it is about supporting the teacher, the qualified teacher, but bringing in expertise, um, which is available in many communities, and for example, around community languages, but not just um, community languages, but also making sure these people are, are people who are, who are well trained um, to, to um, work within a, within a classroom environment and supporting the work of the teacher. Yeah. Uh, move to open questions, and I think Claire Adams is up first. Yeah, it, it, it's um, thank you. Good morning. Um, it, it's really um, around the area of, of what what skills and resources are available at the moment, and where we need to to, to, to get to 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 ensure that this um, is implemented correctly. And really, um, it, 
what additional support and training is required for existing teachers and also how that might change. Um, I'm also a member of the Education and Culture Committee and we've been taking evidence obviously about changes um, around the area of literacy and numeracy. And I noticed you specifically mentioned um, recommendation 20 um, and the evidence given to that committee was that a higher or S level maths and English qualification didn't necessarily indicate that someone was equipped to teach literacy and numeracy. Um, so I'm quite interested in why you've said specifically a language qualification or, or is there a scope within that recommendation to look at other um, assessments of um, capacity to teach language or other routes into to the qualification other than the, that qualification specifically? Uh, the recommend tw recommendation 20 sets, it sen sets the benchmark very high in terms of a, of a higher qualification, uh, something which, as you will see, has not been accepted in, in full by the government. They're recognising the locus of the General Teaching Council, General Teaching Council already looking at, at this particular area, um, and there's a meeting um, next week, in fact, the General Teaching Council involving um, Sarah Breslin of SILT, who I think you're about to, to see as part of the discussions and, uh, and myself. That's a high benchmark, but it is only a start. And it's absolutely correct that, that, that um, um, having a higher in a language doesn't mean you're going to be good at teaching it. Um, the report in its recommendations talks also about the importance of the work of um, universities, of teacher education, uh, and that every um, primary teacher um, should have um, some element of language work as part of initial teacher education. And then beyond that, there's the, the issue of um, uh, CPD, of, of professional development of teachers in, in post. So it is, there's, um, there's a mountain to climb in terms of, of teacher education, but for, for the uh, report to uh, be implemented fully, um, that is something that is going to have to be uh, to be addressed and and carried forward. But um, yes, the the notion of, of skills, the professionalism of teachers, um, and of the um, developing professionalism of teachers is is, is absolutely key to the, the, the success of, of this. I don't know if Julian. Yeah. I think to add anything. what I would add on that is, um, although the recommendation has been that the on entry or an exit they have a language qualification, there would still be further training needed in terms of pedagogy and in terms of the delivery um, and there are, there are varying um, models of MLPS training across Scotland um, but it's still very much recognised that people they may they may have a language they may have a higher degree in a language but they still have to go through how that how that's taught and how that's broken down at primary which is very different to how it's done in secondary as well so I would certainly say that that would be an aspect that would be built on on top of this recommendation and also in terms of the skills and resources that are available um, there have been teachers that have been trained for a great number of years since the, the whole start of the, the initial project of modern languages in the primary school and that was originally when there was 28 day training, it was day release training and it was it was centralised training, that has now been devolved down to local authorities so you do have a varying pattern, so some authorities may still do for example um, 28 day, uh, 28 sessions twilight training, some do 10 days, so that all has to be taken into account as well, I think you'll see a very different picture across authorities and it would be good to try and get some kind of national picture and what that looks like. Again, resources available, it varies from authority to authority. It's something that comes up uh, frequently at koala meetings. Um, you have some authorities who have their own frameworks that they use. You have some authorities who buy it from other authorities. And you have some who use um, materials that have been generated previously by LT Scotland, now Education Scotland, and various places like that. So you do have a real varying picture at the moment. So um, that's certainly a challenge, but not one that, um, that we can't overcome, I don't think. Um, could I ask just a, a, a small supplementary about the articulation between primary and, and secondary schools? Do you see that as being a, a sort of local government policy driven to, to ensure that there's a, um, a continuity there rather than that being a, a sort of national strategy on how to achieve that? I think the, the short answer is it's both. Um, that, um, again, a specific recommendation is that um, local authorities should bring forward their own strategies um, to, to, make, to make this um, possible. Um, 
but the, uh, the transition between primary and secondary is extremely important. There's work to be done, certainly by local authorities, but also the two major organisations will be, or two of the major organisations will be supporting this. And I know you're talking to representatives of both. That's um, uh, Scotland's um, Languages Centre, SILT, um, and also Education Scotland, um, both in its curricular role and also in its in inspectorate role. Um, so we were very together, I think it's fair mm -hmm. to say, within yeah. the working group. Yeah. Uh, and I would be confident that um, the, the will generated by that group will carry through to the work of these organisations mm -hmm. in the implementation mm -hmm. policy. And yes, the transition from primary to secondary is one of the, one of the keys to this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy McGregor. Um, well, my first question is, um, what evidence, in your view, is there from any part of the world as to the best method of ensuring the youngest pupils are successful in becoming fluent speakers in foreign languages. Um, because Scotland has, I think, a very bad reputation in this area. And why do you feel th this is the case? So in other words, it's two questions, really. The first is, uh, what is the best method from any part of the world? And secondly, why has Scotland got a bad reputation? Uh, we looked at um, a considerable body of um, research evidence that shows that if you start, a, a child starts earlier, then there is more of the chance of them beginning uh, properly to learn the language and, and to develop that. In other words, the earlier you start, um, the better for pupils. Um, and that has not been a practice that's been that much applied in Scotland. There has been some practice in, in early primary. There's some pra good practice in, in nursery schools as well. Um, but until now, the recommendation has broadly been starting language learning at primary six. The research evidence shows that that really is too late. Um, and most countries are moving to, towards starting at an, early, an earlier stage. Um, six to nine, um, the age of six, seven or eight, I think, is uh, the norm increasingly in, in European countries. Um, uh, and that, if it's six, that reflects the beginning of the, of the primary school. The primary school in Scotland starts at, at, at age five. There's, there's very strong evidence to, um, to, to, to support that view. It, it does mean a change in Scotland, um, but we, we, uh, we believe very strongly, and the evidence supports us, that you must start early, have continuity, create the momentum, takes you through primary school, takes you through secondary school, and through time you'll have to start to stop the decline in the number of pupils getting qualifications in, in languages. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the examples you can take would be the Walker Road project that um, happened in Aberdeen many years ago where they used um, French and it, it was almost like, I think it, it, it's well recognised and documented that the best way of learning um, the foreign language would be total immersion, which is just something that at, at this point in time is just not something that we're able to do. Um, but I think uh, the Walker Road project showed how that children, you know, the, the, curricul the curriculum was taught in French and they were able to cope with it and it's fine. Now we see a wonderful example of this if you look at Gaelic medium education, for example, where they use the same curriculum but it's obviously delivered in Gaelic as well and the children are able to use both languages and use, use them well and work in those languages. You've also got the project that they have in St Aloysius College in Glasgow which has been supported by the Italian government where, you know, and the model they're using is that, you know, part of the day is completely in Italian. Now that has, has had, had considerable um, funding implications but it has been a project that started and you think that would be another model of doing it. However, we're not in a position where, where that um, could be taken forward at the moment. It would involve a serious overhaul obviously of initial teacher education as well as significant retraining of the teachers that are currently practising. Um, I think one of the ways that we did mention before is CLIL has been able to use certain elements of the curriculum being delivered in that language. Um, the, the, the second question that, that you asked, why does Scotland have such a bad reputation for languages. Um, again, it's that, you know, perhaps, dare I say, it's the whole island syndrome. Everyone else speaks English. So getting back to the core of this report, which is we need to win hearts and minds, which about saying people, languages do matter. 
you know, and we quite often use the example of um, Glasgow taxi drivers who have a smattering in various different languages, but the difference that that makes being able to converse with someone at that initial stage. And in so if we can start with children at that initial stage, they're much more exposed to modern languages in the media now. If you take a lot of the television programmes that they see, and there are many more now, for example, you take Scottish Opera, who've been doing Sing Up Scotland, and they have been working with children in various different languages to enhance that natural curiosity. Lots of different models, and I think what we need to do is look at them and draw on the best parts of them. Thank you. Um, can I carry on? Um, well, that brings me on to the, then what's the capa capacity within the curriculum to accommodate greater language study? Uh, can language learning be embedded in existing teaching? And uh, onto the choice of languages for teaching, which languages should children be learning and why? Perhaps I can begin with the, the last question, because that's a, an important part of the report about which languages pupils should, should learn, and perhaps ask Julian to comment on issues of capacity. Mm -hmm. um, the report sets um, no hierarchy of languages. I think very broadly there are four categories of language, all of which are um, valid. The first one are the traditionally um, the um, the languages of, of, of Europe are the ones which have been broadly taught in, in schools, starting with French for, um, for, for, for many years, but of course there are, there are many other um, languages um, which, um, uh, which are taught and which um, we should be taught in the future. The second one is the, the languages of the growing economies of the world. Uh, and the um, First of that list really is, is Chinese, and there's a lot of a lot of work going on at the moment to encourage the teaching of um, Mandarin Chinese in particular with, within schools, and there are other languages as well. You could add Portuguese because of the importance of Brazil. Um, Russian is coming back into play very strongly as as, as well. The third very important group, um, and Julian has particular expertise in this area, is the is community languages. Now they could be in many cases this, that could be the, the mother tongue language, or it could be the first additional language, although that's um, less common. And the languages there um, uh, include um, uh, Polish, Punjabi, Urdu, and uh, Arabic. These are all um, important languages, of growing importance now within our communities. Um, and, and the last area really is, is Gaelic, the language of, of Scotland, um, which, could, which would also be very much part. It could be a first additional language for, for many pupils, and for, for some pupils it will be, be the first language. The group did not set a hierarchy, did not say that one language was more important than the other, but from this suite of languages that will be um, very much for determination, the needs of communities, the needs of schools, um, consultation with parents as well about what um, would be particularly valuable for the pupils of those schools. And of course we're talking about two additional languages as, as well, so you could, there's the option of, of um, uh, taking languages from, from two of these groups. It's now quite common, for example, to have um, a Chinese plus a, um, a European language, a modern European language in, in schools. And I think Gillian would like perhaps to comment on uh, capacity and to what extent it's embedded in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of capacity, there's, there's the two sides to that. The first of all is, is the capacity to teach it within the curriculum, which was part of the equation. Mm -hmm. Modern languages is a core component of the primary curriculum and secondary curriculum, as you know. So that should it should be being delivered. Um, in terms of being able then to look at L3, it has to be done in, in a manageable way. And there are various different ways of doing that. I think, again, to go back to the example of, of Don Marlock, um, for example, using the master class options now, very often in primary, in order to provide personalisation and choice for children, they have a menu of activities they can do. And very often, second and third languages are involved in this. That's one of the, the, the way to do it. It's also a way to do it in secondary as well. We, have to, we can't forget that, that one plus two is very important for secondary very often we see the dilution of, um, of languages in secondary and that's in part due to capacity of teaching staff. Simon made the point about the, the different types of language that languages that we can do. Um, we, we have the challenge as if we don't have a GTC registered teacher then we're not able to deliver 
that language to a certificated level and if it's not provided by the SQA on their suite of qualifications you then hit a stumbling block you therefore have to look to alternative qualifications such as AQA um, for example and I know that's a particular issue for Punjabi because that's not certificated at SQA um, so in terms of capacity it, it can be done in primary it's already being done but it needs to be enhanced in terms of capacity for teaching staff we have the vicious circle because you see things like the decline of, of certain languages which therefore impacts on the availability of teachers for it and also getting into the thorny area of language departments and universities which have been reduced as well but that's another discussion for another day I'm sure. Um, so we do see the decline of some languages because you know they're not coming through school therefore not going on to university and we don't have the teaching staff if that answers your question Mr McGregor. Can I just come back on oh, okay. um, well at the start um, you, you said I think that the whole thing had to be manageable and you couldn't have sort of 15 languages or something like that. Whereas, and Mr. Macaulay just said, gave a list of a lot of languages and, and said, I think, if I'm right in saying that, that uh, you hadn't made any recommendations as to what was the most important ones. My question was, somebody's going to have to grasp the nettle on this in, in order to, to comply with what you said originally. So, so, I mean, which are the most... When I said, I mean, you, you, you said, you know, a lot of them are important, but you don't say which are the most important. No, we've set no hierarchy. Um, in terms of grasping the nettle, I think that is for, for, for schools and communities, yeah. and these are pupils with, with, um, with, within, within particular schools, and, and they will, will be different. Mm -hmm. But that it, what we're seeking is, is equality of the country, op equality of opportunity of access to, to languages. And it won't be 15 languages within one school, no. for example. Julian, I think, wanted yep. to add to that. The, the, the dominant language that's carried on to, to secondary, is that, which is taught in primary, is determined by the availability of teaching staff at secondary. So if secondary can support, say, French and Spanish, then you will find one or both of them being delivered in primary. To L3, that will depend on the training and the availability of staff. So, um, the, uh, yes, I think that Simon's absolutely right, and I think it's a discussion that will have to be taken at local authority level, but it will be determined by learning communities and the staff that are there. Thank you. Thank you. I've got um, Willie and Hanzala um, and not a lot of time, so I know there's a couple of members that have not asked any questions, so if you want to catch my eye, and I'll put you down now. So, Willie, coffee. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I think if, if the enthusiasm of you two is anything to go by, I think we're well on the way to a successful outcome here, so I congratulate you on your the presentation that you made to us just earlier. Um, I wanted to ask a broader question, if you don't mind. And that is about immersion. I think, Gillian, you were talking about immersion and you said that, oh, well, there's no point in having a, an hour's worth of foreign language one week and then the next time we see it or hear it or, or, or meet it as, as the same time the following week. See, after, after this strategy, this wonderful strategy has been implemented, do you think that children in Scotland are still at a disadvantage? Let me explain what I mean, convener. If you look at children in primary schools, say, throughout Europe, I would say that their exposure for example, to the English language is far higher than Scottish school children's exposure to European languages are through things like media, TV and, and so on and so forth. How will we ever get close to, to bridging that gap? And is there a role for parents in the home and, and perhaps media and so on to play within this new strategy to give our children an opportunity to at least match what other European counterparts are doing? Perhaps um, I'll answer the second question first on the issue of, uh, of exposure to other languages. And again, Julian, to, to, to deal with the first question, which is more a great deal of experience. Um, but Scotland is changing, um, and there, there is exposure to languages and other languages in a way that has not been uh, true, uh, true in the past. Um, I've mentioned already the growth of community languages. Um, and... Uh, it, in addition to community languages, we hear um, a, a great deal more of European languages spoken in the streets, spoken in hotels and cafes and in tourism um, uh, going around the country. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a changing community, a changing country. Um, I'm particularly st struck in, in Edinburgh, not just in Edinburgh, of the, the, the number of people you hear in the streets speaking um, Chinese Mandarin. Uh, Scots are increasingly hearing these languages. It's not quite so 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 strange as it would have been a generation before. Um, and I, and what is also apparent 
uh, and that's particularly apparent in, in introducing um, Chinese in schools, is just how ready children, particularly young children, are to, to go the step beyond listening to, to, to strange languages to them uh, and wanting to, to acquire them and develop them. And I think it is important, and I think we have a chance, unique perhaps to, to Scotland within the United Kingdom, in taking this agenda. We are working closely together um, on this. I think there's a, an opportunity for the stakeholder bodies to, to work in a unique way to take this agenda forward and to make sure that our schools are more equipped for the modern world, more equipped um, for, um, to uh, teach languages to children and more and more they do thirst to learn languages. Um, to, to look at your question about immersion and, um, and uh, the implications, I think one of the things um, to bring it right down to grassroots level, if you take secondary for example, is timetabling. Um, and that's a huge thing um, for local authorities and for schools. You know, if you have, for example, two periods of a language a week, you know, for say an, an hour and a bit, or do you have it four periods a week for 40 minutes, okay, which, which then has huge implications for teaching and learning. You mentioned about the media and the exposure. I think we, we have to look at um, the way that um, languages are being taught. And getting, and getting away perhaps from um, older methodology and there are fabulous and wonderful examples of fantastic methodology and projects that people are using, engaging with social media, engaging more with the, the way that our young people learn and I think that's one of the things to take into consideration. But I think also looking back at, um, at head teachers and looking at the leadership and actually to say to them, you know, this is part of your literacy component, okay? Modern languages sits, you know, beside the language element um, of, the, of the core curriculum and it's about showing the importance of how learning a modern language not only broadens your horizons in terms of cultural appreciation and celebrating what's different and special about Scottish culture and heritage in other countries, but also as well to look at how um, it enhances literacy as well. And I think if we can really, again, to keep, to keep going back to the heart of our, our paper about changing the perception of languages and hearts and minds, if we work with head teachers and also if we engage with parents to therefore use their expertise and use people who have um, different languages on the ground, um, that would increase the exposure that children would have. We have to keep this manageable. Of course, it would be wonderful to have immersion. We would love that. That's a, you know. Um, but then again, if you ask other um, subject specialists, they'll say, well, we would like that for our subject. We are very much aware that we are fighting the corner for languages here. Um, so I think there are, I think to, to, to sum up, there are implications for teaching and learning so that we can use more exposed to the media. I think um, we really need to work carefully with head teachers and to get back to the very to the very um, the first point that we made is about really impressing upon them how important it is but keeping it manageable if that answers your question thank you okay thanks Kim. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much um, interesting uh, figures um, I'm really quite proud of the fact that we have such a diverse language spread right across across Scotland I want to pick up one or two points there, though. The first of all, uh, you've touched on it briefly, and that is, do existing teachers have the skills for teaching and are resources available for them for tuition? And also, um, should we be doing more to t train our teachers to equip them better to deal with, with language, um, and particularly if they're maybe teaching more than one language, uh, how much more support would they actually want? And is there, in fact, a willingness, have we identified a willingness from teacher staff currently in position, whether they would actually wish to take on the additional responsibility? There's, I think we've discovered from um, talking to teachers in schools, we also discovered from the work, I should say, of the, the inspectorate in schools, so who are observing what is happening in schools across Scotland. There is a, a, a tremendous amount of good practice. There are a tremendous number of teachers, both primary and secondary, who are excellent teachers of languages, who, who, who inspire great enthusiasm among, among pupils. And in secondary schools, I know that's beyond the remit of this particular group, who um, take pupils forward to certification to, to higher and beyond. Um, that is not universally the case. So I think the, the, the central point is, is true, that um, a, a great deal further has to be done in terms of, of teacher education um, from young people who are now in school considering future careers, considering going into teaching, 
um, to, to encourage them, to, first of all, to move into teaching and encourage them to, to move into teaching of, of languages. Um, there will have to be an increase in that. There's a recommendation in this in the report, which has um, not been 100% accepted by, by the Minister because there are, there are issues of workforce planning generally around that. Um, but yes, we, we do have to bring teachers into the profession who have, um, who have both um, uh, a qualification and the skills and the pedagogy that Gillian has mentioned um, to, to be able to, to teach languages well. Um, that's a role um, in terms of recruitment. It's a role in terms of the universities. Um, and the universities have a very important role here in terms of, of teacher education. In terms of willingness of teacher, yes, I think um, most teachers are very anxious to see languages develop in, in, in schools. But there are barriers to overcome as, as well, and that's part of winning hearts and minds. Um, it's the communities in Scotland, it's, it's parents, it's pupils themselves to overcome barriers. In some cases, it's teachers. We have to um, convince teachers that language is something integral to the work of the school. Mm -hmm. And we've seen lots of good examples of good practice, but that's not necessarily the majority of schools mm -hmm. in, in terms of um, convincing teachers that, it's, uh, that language is something that they can do, they can support, provided they themselves are supported. And that's why the role of um, other native speakers of languages, foreign language assistance and so on, is so important. Mm -hmm. If I can just pick up on the, uh, the the first part you're talking about the skills and resources, and I think first of all in terms of primary, um, there's a there's a real different picture across authorities about training, um, and that's one of the big things. And I think it, it really depends on if there's someone driving that through an authority. Um, and so you, you'll see different pictures. What you do find is there are groups of authorities who work together to train together and to send teachers to other authorities, for example, for primary. In terms of willingness of teaching staff, we've actually seen an increase, and again, I can only speak for Glasgow, but an increase of the uh, the number of primary teachers who want to train in languages. And, I, and it's happening quite slowly, but we've seen a pattern over the past few years. Um, and the suite of languages that we're able to offer is obviously, um, is, is, is obviously getting bigger as well. In terms of secondary, where you do find that there are single linguists where teachers can only teach one language, there should be the opportunity in which they're given um, to, to train again. Now, this, again, depends on the availability of courses by university. And again, I can only speak for Glasgow, but we do have um, a, a framework where teachers are partly funded to go back to university and do the continuous certificate of education where they can qualify in another modern foreign language. And again, that's dictated by what can be offered by universities. So you can see there's a bit of a kind of a circle going on. But I would say there is a willingness now of teaching staff, and particularly in primary and in early years as well, particularly for child development officers, because they value the importance of it, and particularly the early stages for language acquisition rather than language learning. I think I think we, we are the tide is beginning to change and I think there is a willingness of staff in terms of resources, your bigger your biggest resource as a teacher. So and um, thank you very much for, for bringing that to my attention. I've always had a very high regard of the teaching staff in Glasgow. I I felt that they've they particularly face very serious challenges in Scotland. And it, it's it's really pleasing to know that there are teachers who are willing to go that extra mile and I'm grateful to them for the, for doing that. I have also noticed that uh, in my questions to the minister in regards to language, in particular Punjabi, um, he had suggested that SQA did not certificate Punjabi language because there wasn't a high demand for it. Yet, when I look at these figures, it shows the contrary. I mean, there are 15 authorities su supporting Punjabi language, which is incredible, and I'm sure the minister will be very keen and interested to know this figure and perhaps ask SQA questions on how they came to their conclusion. But uh, what, the, the issue about um, language choice and uh, uh, grappling the nettle, as, as the phrase was used, I appreciate that there will be political pressures as well. However, I also note from the figures in front of me that Arabic is not being supported as well as it could be. And I know a lot of schools particularly in Glasgow, who have hundreds of pupils who are being taught Arabic outside school hours. And I just don't understand why the authorities are up and down Scotland are not supporting it in schools. Clearly there is a demand. Uh, perhaps the community who teach the Arabic language are perhaps not articulated in terms of approaching the schools to actually take on that responsibility. Could you suggest how that could be done to, to reverse that trend? I'm going to ask 
Gillian to respond to that because she uh, does have particular expertise. I really want to, to, to stress that um, the importance of community languages within the, this report um, and the kind of messages that the group wants to send out about a diverse and multicultural Scotland, that these are, are languages of, 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 of equal, equal status and um, they, there will, will be many pupils for whom the community languages, including Punjabi, Urdu and Arabic are, and Polish, are the, are, are the first language. In terms of the work within Glasgow and supporting Arabic in particular, I think Julian yeah. may. And Punjabi, absolutely. Um, in te um, I think we're very well aware that in many authorities there are children who um, are attending Saturday school, who are attending classes after school in order to um, in order to enhance and, and, and to further their studies of, the, of their mother tongue. And I think it's, it's a really, really valid point. It's something that desperately needs addressed. Um, what you tend to find is that um, the... Again, it comes back to initial teacher education and GTC registered teachers. However, if you look at the provision of EAL, for English as an additional language, then teachers who are able to support EAL very often are Arabic speakers, Punjabi speakers and Urdu speakers, however, may not be registered to teach those languages with the General Teaching Council. And I think the discussion that's happening next week with the General Teaching Council regarding that, um, regarding not only initial teacher education, but perhaps the way that people can be registered to teach that. Um, what we have seen, for example, if you take the example of Mandarin Chinese, which is, you know, is, is, is very much in, in the media and very much um, one of the, 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 the flagship areas in, in terms of modern languages, it started off with this hub concept whereby they were given support and slowly and surely you can see how that's grown. I wonder if perhaps that's a model that we look for, particularly for Arabic and we look and for Punjabi and Urdu. Urdu, although is certificated to SQA, it's still very much only undertaken by native speakers. And what we would like to see would be the way that Mandarin has been demystified and we now have far more non-native speakers, I have to say, having studied Mandarin myself, um, once once you start doing it and you understand it, we need to do the same job for our community languages. And I think that would be a discussion that would be worthwhile having with interested stakeholders. And I'll perhaps speak to you at another point about that. But I think if we can look at something, a similar model that's happened, because now you can see that it's growing and children are, and, and other interested stakeholders are now taking that forward. It's also a discussion for SQE as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, Rod Campbell. Uh, morning. Um, <coughs> Are there any special considerations that have been given for pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds who might perhaps struggle with the programme? Can I ask what you would mean by disadvantaged backgrounds? Well, right at the bottom of the, of the, the pecking order, kind of, uh, In terms was deprived. Of... Mm -hmm. uh, the, the equality agenda underpins um, very much what we are trying to achieve through this this, this report, um, and what we're asking local authorities to do is is to to recognise the diversity of of, of backgrounds of pupils, uh, to recognise that there are issues in urban areas which are very different from the challenges in many rural areas of of uh, sparse um, communities um, where access to teachers of, of um, another language would be very difficult indeed. Um, what we are saying is that um, every child can benefit from additional language regardless of their background, um, regardless of, of where, they, where they live in, in, in Scotland. There's also uh, substantial evidence um, in introducing um, new language earlier that the children who um, are finding parts of the curriculum challenging, um, do benefit from um, the, the additional language at an early stage. I think, Julian, you may have experience of that, but you may want to, again, in Glasgow, there are specific issues which you may want to... Not even just develop. in Glasgow. I think, l let's be clear that even children in deprived areas or non-deprived areas, we still have the same high aspirations for all of them, regardless of where they stay. Um, and I think, you know, and. To, to use the terminology, getting it right for every child, then we need to meet each of our learners on their own journey and be able to provide a language experience which is proper and robust for them. Um, I, 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 working in a, in a school in Glasgow um, which would be perhaps described as a, a deprived area um, in, in the north of the city, um, 
all of our children are doing two languages. But what we have to do is look at the particular learning needs of these children. And for example, it's more appropriate that they follow courses that involve talking and listening, and they're allowed more time to focus on their mother tongue literacy when it comes to reading and writing. So I think we have to look at the individual child. I don't think we can say that um, in terms of deprived areas, because we, we would want to have the same high aspirations for all of our children. OK, uh, um, another issue. Recommendation 10 encourages the development of links between language learning and the issues of employability and citizenship. Um, have you considered a thought or a, how, how do you envisage that um, possible link between kind of uh, traditional teaching and uh, kind of private and other organisations on the employability and citizen side? How is that going to work in practice? Um, I, I think uh, I'm very pleased that the question has been asked, particularly about employability, because yeah. I think this um, is, uh, as I think I said at the outset, one of the key drivers um, of what we're seeking to, to, to do. Um, and in very simple terms, Scots are going to lose out in the employment markets of the future and unless they're able to engage with people in languages other than their own. So the kind of messages the schools and um, primary as well, but um, certainly secondary schools are the key to that, uh, um, are, um, are increasingly conveying those messages. Um, engagement with, with, with businesses as well. Um, uh, that um, the, the, the markets of the future, the big markets of the future in Asia and elsewhere, it simply isn't going to be enough to just to speak, speak English. Related to that is the question of citizenship and um, much of what the work that has been done on language development actually springs from issues of, of global citizenship within schools, uh, within what is now becoming broad general education within schools, uh, of understanding Scotland's place in the world, understanding other cultures, uh, and then the step beyond that is beginning to learn that the, that the language is um, associated with other countries, um, other cultures. Um, and it also um, brings back the, the relevance of language to try and move um, language out of the box of this is, this is language, this is something you do in specified periods within the school. Julian's mentioned quite a lot about um, um, intercurricular working within schools, um, of using language as a medium to teach other parts of the curriculum. It, it is about... Um, relevance, it's about Scotland's place in the world, and it's about the jobs that young people in schools now aspire to and their future employability. If I can just add to, to what Simon said, in terms of employability, um, I think one of the, the key things is to start looking at the models that schools can use in terms of, for example, for work experience, um, so that there's actually a real application for the language that children are learning. Very often, um, it's been the case in the past where there's a an awful lot of language learning going on, but it can't actually be used in a practical sense. And I think that's been very much um, underpinning the, the the thoughts behind the ASQA's new qualifications at Language for Life and Work. So they're actually learning skills, they're actually learning language um, that they're able to use in, in the work setting. And we, and we have to be able to show our children that they don't have to go abroad to use a modern language. And if we can show them how it's used in a local context, then I think that's something that, that we can build on. And it also, in, in terms of broadening their horizons, we see examples of, and again, I can only talk um, with any great knowledge about what's happening in Glasgow, but I'm sure it's the same for other cities where they're twinned with other cities in, in Europe um, and, um, and around the world. And what certainly we've been able to do is to set up links um, where we can use teacher exchanges for professional visits to see in terms of teaching and learning how it's delivered, but also starting to move into work experience. Now, that doesn't have to be abroad. That can be used in international companies here in, in, the, in Scotland. Very often, the, the, the example that's used is IBM in Greenock, and a lot of children will go there to do work experience and to show how they can actually use their language. The key thing would be is that we're able to show children and our young learners that they can actually use the language that they are learning in a local context. Just a final question, if I may. Just um, uh, recommendation 19 re uh, recommends uh, further engagement with the FE and HE sec se sectors. Um, is there any difference in approach that should be required from the FE sector from the colleges as opposed to universities? Perhaps you could say a little bit more about that. Uh, I th the one thing that the working group learned was the, the, the rapid decline of language teaching within further education. Yeah. Um, and further education wasn't part of the, the remit of the, the group. 
um, but they were very anxious that there really should be an engagement with the FE sector to, 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 to take that forward. Julie has already mentioned the decline of language teaching in universities. Um, and it is important that there are signals within higher education, not with, just within teacher education within, within universities, but also within language departments of universities. In any case, um, the Donaldson report um, uh, covering teacher education talks a lot about the links between schools of education uh, and the, the other parts of the university. Again, not have a, a block sitting apart, that education is somehow... An, Teacher education is somehow different from what goes on within the, within the, the rest of the university. So, yes, the um, talking about in detail but further in higher education went beyond the scope of the remit of the group. Um, but you can't make all of this work unless further and higher education um, uh, are part of what what happens. Yeah. I think um, there has to be there has to be more dialogue between um, schools and further education institutes, colleges and, and higher education as well. And also that would also bring uh, to the forefront the widening access agenda, which is, is obviously a bit of a hot one at the moment as well. And that would have to be looked at. I don't think there's necessarily enough dialogue or articulation between them. And I think that's something that does have to happen. We tend to see that there's, um, there's, a, there's a lot of work now being undertaken by, for example, if you take Strathclyde University, they have the project of their language ambassadors, where they'll send students out to schools to talk to pupils and to say, this is what you can do, and this is what campus life is like. But here's also what doing a language degree entails. And events such as that and initiatives such as that will help and I think that it would also be ideal for, for schools and for, and for local authorities to engage with the further education colleges and the further education providers within their localities such as well to try and articulate that and I think it's a, a very valid point and something that I think local authorities and schools would, uh, would take forward. It's certainly something that um, I've made a note to do. Yeah, I think um, we've sort of pushed the boundaries of our time this morning. Um, it, it, in thanking you for, for uh, coming along, I think we could have spent a lot more time exploring uh, a lot of the areas and we may come back to you on a number of them. One thing that you did mention, uh, Mr McCauley, was the GTC registration meeting next week about some of the challenges around registration. We'd be very interested in how that meeting goes and if there's any outcome from that or any progress, we would be very interested to yes, hear about that. I think you're also talking to somebody from the General Teaching Council in any yes. case as part of this, yeah. this, this process. Yeah, it's always good to get both sides of the story. <laughs> um, so th thank you very much. Um, there'll be a brief uh, recess just to allow change over for uh, witnesses, but thank thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on very swiftly to agenda item two, um, a, we welcome uh, for uh, further evidence on our language inquiry from uh, John Bissett, who is a senior policy officer on the languages team, and Tim Simons, who's head of curriculum unit at the Scottish Government. And I believe, gentlemen, you have a brief opening statement too. Um, yes, I'm going to make a, a brief um, opening um, statement. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Tim Simons. I'm head of the curriculum unit uh, in Learning Directorate uh, in DG Learning and Justice of the Scottish Government. I'm responsible for policy development uh, for curriculum issues across seven uh, of the eight curricular areas in Curriculum for Excellence. In addition to languages, uh, this includes science, maths, technologies, social studies, expressive arts, uh, and re religious and moral education. That's everything except um, health and well-being. Um, I'm also responsible for literacy and numeracy and five cross-cutting themes of Curriculum for Excellence, which I think are very relevant uh, in this context. Uh, that's enterprise education, creativity, 
international education, citizenship and sustainable development and uh, the latter three are often um, grouped together to talk in terms of uh, global citizenship or responsible global citizenship. Um, the manifesto commitment um, that the government uh, adopted at the last election was to create the conditions in which every child will learn two languages in addition to their own mother tongue. Uh, and this will be rolled out over two parliaments and will create a new model of language acquisition um, in Scotland. And to take this forward, the uh, a languages working group was set up by ministers in September 2011 and the report Language Learning in Scotland, a one plus two approach, was published on the 17th of May uh, this year and launched at Sacred Heart uh, Primary School um, by the Minister. Uh, the government response was published on the 20th of November. Um, and as Simon said, uh, shortly after that, a week after that, there was a major uh, conference held in Stirling Management Centre to promote the government response and uh, take uh, the actions forward. Um, the language's commitment aims to develop the teaching of languages within Curriculum for Excellence. It aims to improve learners' engagement with and achievement in languages learning and to achieve better public understanding and awareness of languages, both in terms of the big issues we face in the world, including our economic competitiveness and as a career option for young people. The commitment is as much about changing attitudes to languages in schools and society, including uh, with parents, with employers and in the media, as it is ensuring better and more language learning takes place. And just on this point, um, bearing in mind your previous questions, um, the languages uh, working group contained representatives from employers and the National Parent Forum for Scotland, so those uh, voices were heard. Um, uh, in, in uh, the group. It's, all of this is about preparing young people for a radically different world than the one we know today, the one certainly when I went to school, and one where young people with an interest in and positive disposition towards learning languages will be at a distinct advantage compared to their peers. Ministers have welcomed the report and its 35 recommendations they have accepted 31 of the recommendations in full and four in part. And they've recognised that taking these forward will require discussion, collaboration and partnership with local authorities, with schools, with parents, employers and other key stakeholders. So just very briefly to su summarise um, the, the key issues, the commitment, government commitment is to create the conditions. It's not about imposing this on local authorities. It's not only about primary schools. I know your report, uh, your, your inquiry is uh, to do with primary schools, but it is for secondary schools and early years establishments. It's a three to 18 agenda. It has a, a two parliament time frame, uh, as Simon's already mentioned, i.e. By, by 2020. So it's a long term, it's a long term uh, change. And finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, this is about cultural change. It's about changing attitudes to languages in schools, in society as a whole. Um, I just briefly want to introduce my colleague, John Bissett, who's the, the curriculum, um, the languages team leader in the curriculum unit. John attended all the meetings of the languages working group and provided um, a secretariat and uh, assistance to Simon Macaulay. So with that, uh, look forward to your questions. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, the, it, the, the two key things that, that you mentioned there, you mentioned four key things, but two of them, creating the right conditions and the cultural change. I think we uh, witnessed that very, very clearly when we visited Del Delman at primary school. And uh, Claire Adams and myself have a visit to a school in Hamilton in a few weeks' time, which I think has a Spanish hub. Um, and we're very, very, very well aware of some of the Confucius hubs that have, that have developed uh, across Lanarkshire too. Um, so look at, looking at the cultural change, maybe if you could give us some, some insight into how you see that developing, but creating the conditions, obviously ask some questions earlier about the skills capacity and you know the, the abilities within the, the, the existing structures and how you tease out the best of that and, and use it to the best. One of the challenges that, that we um, heard about when we spoke to teachers at Dalmarnock Primary School was about the use of GLOW. 
And um, I mean, GLOW should be the medium for, for sharing materials, for sharing ideas, for sharing information. But the minute they go into GLOW and try to search outside the parameters of the UK, they, they're, they're not allowed to. So, I, I mean, I think that might be just a small technical fix, but I, I don't know if it's something that it came across in any of the, 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 the challenges that were coming up for teachers and any of the, the information that you've got. So I don't know whether you know about the challenges with GLOW and you're dealing with it. And if you are, could you give us an insight into how that's been developed? There are some challenges with GLOW, but, um, and it's not our area at all in Learning Directorate, so I have to, to say that. Um, but there are steps being taken to, to address it. There's a major reform of, of GLOW um, taking place, and uh, I, I would have to come back to you if you would like more details about that. Um, I do know that some um, uh, local authorities use GLOW extensively and do find it uh, extremely useful for sharing um, and also accessing foreign media and article, uh, articles and sharing those amongst them. And also for young people who do use it to, to see that there is much more um, uh, uh, exposure to, to language as a result of that. You know, uh, the, the, it, I think the whole um, issue about um, awareness of young people in uh, today's world about that the world around them is, is much greater than it was in the past. And seeing news reports um, on television with other people speaking other languages, young people are much more aware of it. And also, as been mentioned in your previous session, uh, exposure to other languages through young people uh, who come here, who, who are, are living here, and they're, they're foreign nationals. Um, we had some um, evidence um, gathered from local authorities about the main three languages after English um, and uh, uh, spoken in, in schools. And uh, in 22 out of 32 authorities, they, this, the, the main three language, the, 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 sorry, the top language after English is Polish. So there's a lot of exposure of young people to, to Polish in, in schools. Yeah, as, as uh, Simon has said, that the you know there are issues with GLOW, and we, we certainly hope that the the next generation of GLOW, whatever it looks like, will be much more accessible. Um, we are doing some work with SILT, which is National Languages Centre based at Strathclyde University. The promotion of languages is very much part of the work of SILT, and they've been overhauling their website. So, for example, there's a an entire section now on the one plus two approach where SILT is developing messages for um, teachers and, 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 and for uh, policy uh, leaders and, and local authorities. It's also developing messages for, for parents. And I think the, in, in terms of effect in a, a culture change, I think we have to draw on the, the, the increasing weight of evidence um, that languages is something of a huge benefit to not, not just to our, our young people as individuals in terms of their, their, their confidence to engage with the, the, the world that gr they're growing up in, but also in terms of their, their future economic prospects as well. You know, the, 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 there are regular surveys now that suggest that, you know, that in, in the nature of the globalised economy that, that, that we uh, 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 live in, that uh, increasingly companies are, uh, are looking for youngsters who can offer more than just one language. You know, it's, it's about our, our young people having the opportunity to, um, uh, uh, you know, have the best opportunity to uh, make their way in the world. And increasingly, they're in competition with young people from Europe, for example, can offer two and three other languages. So, so there's a strong, there are a number of strong drivers for actually suggesting that really we need, to, or Scotland needs to improve its performance in languages. And I think it, drawing that, that evidence to the attention of um, a, a teachers, to a parents and so on, that will begin uh, to help us to make that, 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 that culture uh, shift and to uh, lead people to see you know, that, that this is an agenda that other countries take seriously and, and Scotland should do so as well. I think, I think you're, you're absolutely one of the key elements there as teachers, and we, we discussed that obviously in the, the earlier session. The, the parents that, that we met um, at Dunman at primary school that day um, were very, very keen, uh, and they were coming along to extracurricular um, events and um, speaking, you know, the, picking up words at home, and they were talking about going on holiday and relying on the young, the, the young person in the family to, to, to see their way about, um, you know, ordering in restaurants and things like that. And it's about that 
context that obviously allows young people to, to, to learn uh, much more effectively. But I think, you know, the buy-in of parents... Um, is is something that, that is going to be key for the, for this to work because it can't just be about you know that one hour a week. It has to be about you know much 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 more than that. And you know we we heard about the working groups recommendations and plans around that, and we've seen you know in action in Domanic Primary School. But that might just be Domanic Primary School. So what what type of work is being done to identify you know what is happening across the rest of Scotland and whether that good practice can be easily applied because it may, it may not be in different settings. I think from, from what you've heard already this morning, I mean, it, it's quite clear that this is a, a really broad agenda. There's a whole number of kind of work strands that we really need to uh, take forward. I mean, it, and it, I think it's a process that we're embarking on. Um, in the last uh, year or so, we've had the, the Report of the Languages Working Group. Uh, ministers have given a, 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 a welcome to, to that. And building on the national conference that we had in November, I think we are now looking at setting a number of things in train. Clearly, we're going to have to have some kind of oversight or implementation group to ensure that a policy that's designed for not just the lifetime of the, this parliament, but to 2020 and so on, is maintained and kept on course. It's going to require a lot of sustained effort on the part of uh, government, local authorities, uh, schools and so on. So, so one of the things we'll be pulling together uh, fairly soon is a, a kind of implementation group uh, to oversee that. Recommendation two within the Languages Working Group report, I think, is, is, is critical. It's, it's one that calls on local authorities to develop their own uh, strategies and plans. And I think uh, unless the, the plans are, are owned by authorities and by schools, then uh, the, the policy will, will, will not be delivered. So the work that we do over the coming period with, with authorities will, will, will be uh, important. Um, ministers have announced um, uh, funding for a number of pilot projects, for example, to run in the current school year. There are 10 projects uh, running, um, uh, or some are already underway, some are, are, are starting up just now. Six in the primary sector looking at what are the implications of introducing uh, language learning from primary one? You know, um, what are the uh, issues around introducing a, a second additional language from later in primary and, a, and, a, and indeed into the broad general education phase in a, a secondary school? Um, some looking at the, the transition between primary and secondaries, and uh, the, the, there's a pilot pro project looking at languages within the senior phase. So there's a lot of lessons that I think we will draw from uh, those pilot projects that will help to inform local authority strategies and, and delivery. Um, we've also got, you know, um, key partners such as Education Scotland, which draws together the lessons to be learnt from uh, school inspections and uh, uh, SILT, as I mentioned, um, of, which provides a lot of training and CPD for teachers. They've got a lot of examples of what is already working well. Um, the Modern Languages Excellence Group report, which came out about uh, 18 months, two years ago, highlighted a, a whole range of uh, good things going on in schools across Scotland. So we know it's not just on Marnock. Uh, it's uh, trying to pull together that, the, the best of what is happening. One of the key messages that came out of the National Conference, particularly from the practitioners who were there, was that they need time and space, or certainly appreciate the time and space to learn from each other. So again, that's an area that I think we'll want to look at quite closely. How do we get schools learning from each other? How do we get local authorities learning from each other? And I think that will be a key element of, of, of the work that we take forward over the, uh, the coming years. Thanks very much for that. I think I've got open and out questions, and I've got Jamie up first, Hans Allen, and then Willie. So, if any other members want to ask questions, please let me know. Jamie. Uh, thank you. Um, I hope it's all right to ask you this question. Is there enough funding for the Scottish Government's proposal, including the use of EU money? Um, well, I'll start, and John can perhaps add. Um, John's already mentioned the um, importance of Recommendation 2, which the government has accepted about local authorities um, planning their, for their, uh, the, the implementation of this, working very closely with schools and parents and engaging with them to ascertain um, what the, um, their uh, provision is, is, what they're able to provide. And you've had an insight from, from Gillian as to what Glasgow um, are doing in that. I think this is absolutely crucial in making this whole um, 
uh, ambition work is the, the work that local authorities do because they, they have a lot of trained staff who have been trained under the Modern Languages for Primary School programme who aren't being used effectively at the moment, for example. And I think they need to ascertain where they are and what they're doing and how they can resurrect that, um, that those skills, perhaps with additional training. Um, and um, it's th that will take time, as they, John was saying, that one of the outcomes of the conference was, you know, local authorities need time to think this through and to plan accordingly. And some authorities have, are already well on the way to doing this. They've got a, a very good idea about who their skilled teachers are, where they are. And um, we, we know that some, uh, that quite a few of the, the, the teaching profession already do have uh, an, a higher or equivalent in language, but they haven't used it. So it's again identifying who they are, where they are, and whether they would like to use it, that those skills to en enhance their, their teaching professionalism. Um, and for every authority, for every school, this will be different. So this will take a bit of time. Um, I think in, in terms of the actual funding, um, the government have, uh, 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 have set aside £120,000 this year for these pilot projects. In addition, um, in the debate on the 23rd of May last year, the minister announced that uh, £4 million pending the uh, agreement by Parliament of the budget would be available for local authorities um, for the next financial year to take this work forward. And the, the, uh, the group has, uh, the Languages Working Group has estimated that overall uh, two to three times that amount would be um, needed. I think this can be done if it's well planned and well thought through. And I think we're at the, the early stages now of um, ascertaining uh, with the local authorities what their needs are and where their needs will be and when. So um, I hope that... John, do you want to add anything? The only point I would add to that is that, you know, ministers are well aware that, you know, this is a, an ambitious objective to, to be delivered over a, 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 you know, a, a period of time. They recognise that re additional resource will be required, and to that extent, as Tim has men mentioned, that um, the... Minister has earmarked £4 million for next year, is also committed to uh, further discussions with COSLA and with ADES on the longer term resource implications, which once we begin to see local authority strategies develop and uh, particularly their audit of provision will help inform future uh, discussions around uh, uh, resources. You, you described um, producing the best formula to, for, for Scottish children to be able to compete in the new world that you described, which I totally agree with you with. Um, Mr. Bissett described a very broad front at the moment. How are you going to... There will come a point, obviously, where this has got to be narrowed down uh, to, to, and, and given detail as to how... You know, what, is, what are the actual languages that are going to be taught in the schools and, and for what reason? Um, I mean, obviously, after great consultation and everything else, I mean, when do you envisage uh, that process taking place and who will be in charge of it? Um, I, I, I envisage this will all come out in this audit that local authorities will be undertaking over the next um, six to 12 months. So but by this time next year, I would hope that every local authority would know um, who their trained teachers are, where they are, what languages they can offer uh, from primary one, what languages they can offer uh, from primary five, the, the third language. And crucially, you know, that will be very much dictated by what is able to be provided in the, the secondary school. And this is the actual crucial point about transitions between primary and secondary, because we know from a survey that was undertaken by the National Languages Centre, SILT, that a third of uh, schools do not have any primary schools do not have any sort of transition plan on languages with their secondary school. Um, so that, that absolutely has to be addressed. And the, the, the primary schools need to liaise very closely with their secondary schools. So if they start off with um, young people in primary one learning a particular language and they can only get to primary 
seven, and then it falls by the wayside because there's no provision in secondary. That is, is just not a good use of resources whatsoever. They need to be providing the language that, that will um, progress through and so that when they move into secondary, young people are enthusiastic about languages and there we'll see, we'll see a, a much greater take up of languages, we hope, in, in uh, certification levels. Um, and in due course as well, the universities, to going back to your previous um, evidence session, the universities will be noticing this and, and providing more language um, uh, uh, courses and more, more throughput of, of students in, in higher education. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm interested in the two comments you make. One is a possible need for additional resource beyond what's already been allocated, and only time will dictate what sort of resource that would mean. The second point I absolutely agree with is this joined up system in which primary school, secondary school, college and universities are all aligned so that they, we can maximize the skill that we endow into our, our, our youth. However, I'm just wondering, it, it may be more um, that Gillian might actually take this point up, is the engagement with communities who have these skills. So if we've got communities from the Polish community, the French community, and there are so many organizations within, our, within Scotland from all these language bases that our teachers can actually engage with. So we need to have a structure where our teachers could be invited by these organizations. So it's, 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 it's a two-way traffic, so we engage with these organizations. But more importantly, once those contacts have been established, established, perhaps the teachers with those organizations could share some of the cultural events in our schools, which will once again reinforce the language skill. So it's not just simply about our language, but also what are the cultures of that language, because it's, it goes hand in glove in terms of language and culture. Uh, being aware of one's culture is almost as important as the language skill in itself. We have luckily in Scotland over 50, 150 odd communities. So we do have that opportunity available to us. All we really need to do is organize ourselves to be able to tap into that resource. And I'm just wondering whether you are in a position to be able to do that and support the, the staff in, in making those connections. We, we would certainly support local authorities who are innovative in their approaches. And um, you're, you're absolutely right, there is a huge wealth of, of opportunities out there. A lot of this comes down to the attitudes of the teachers, of bringing in parents. And we're working with the National Parent Forum for Scotland in uh, trying to change the whole uh, uh, attitude um, towards parental involvement, because parents are a huge, huge resource. And uh, you mentioned before, um, convener, the, um, the Spanish uh, parent who came into Delmarnock Primary School. Uh, we want to see more of that being used because this, this breaks down the sort of myths about language learning uh, to, for young people to have a native speaker in a classroom um, speaking and um, playing games or singing songs and having fun and making, making learning uh, great fun to, to uh, to, to be part of, and um, yeah, the the um, point about cultural events and things, I think, is absolutely very important as well. And, and, and I've, I've spoken to teachers who have encouraged their their pupils to bring in um, artifacts and articles from their home country, and they come in with with. Um, coins or notes and then they talk about it and just the excitement that is generated in, in the class by that um, and that can lead to cultural events and celebrations and things being um, being being followed through so we would welcome the Scottish government would welcome um, any innovative approaches like this but I think it comes down to the, the, the attitude of teachers there's one other thing I want to mention and that is uh, Edinburgh University um, uh, offered um, some of its um, uh, uh, foreign students the opportunities to go out and, and uh, chum up with a school and go into a school and, and talk to, to um, pupils about their country. And there were a wide variety of languages used there. 
um, from um, Malay to um, Polish and and, uh, and Chinese, um, I believe. And the, uh, res the there was an um, evaluation of that, and it was. Uh, proven to be very, very successful, and young people in in those primary schools where <coughs> students went were just excited to to learn about uh, Malaysia and the language they spoke, even though that wouldn't be uh, probably uh, one of the, the languages. It could be, but it, it, it probably wouldn't in the grand scale of, of things that was taken forward uh, right through to secondary school. Just to follow up, in terms of engaging with local councils who then in turn would engage with local organizations. I'm just wondering what aspect of that support you could lend the authorities in, in establishing that. I mean, I, I know that people can encourage local authorities to engage directly with the organizations who are currently in their areas. However, what support you could possibly lend them, if any, so that at least they would know to approach you to, to, to tap into that support? The the, um, the the funding that the government um, uh, will, will make available for this, is, as, as I've described, is, is yet to be confirmed. Um, but um, if the, the four million pounds was um, approved by Parliament, um, we will have discussions with with uh, COSLA about how best that can be utilised by local authorities. But w when it's uh, provided to local authorities, we we would. Um, respect their uh, approach to utilizing that and if that involved an innovative approach as we've just been discussing uh, we would be very supportive of that i think it may be worth uh, saying as well that you're thinking about asking local authorities to have an audit of provision is um, we're not just thinking of that in terms of um, teaching provision within schools but the, we think about wider parameters, you know, what kind of resources are available to schools within their own local community, what kind of partnerships can be developed with business in, in their area, so that when authorities then come to develop their languages strategy, it's an all-encompassing strategy, it's not one that's just based on what's happening in uh, particular schools, but it's about engagement with the community, it's about drawing in uh, resources on their, on their doorstep or uh, through IT uh, further afield, it's links with the universities or cultural organisations. So it's trying to get schools and authorities to think about the resources that are there more widely than uh, you know, just uh, at, at their own hand. Um, this something that touches on the, a previous question about languages and which languages. I think if we were sitting in a, a country like Spain, which a few years ago did think about trying to uh, extend its language provision, uh, it's easier in a country where, for example, you know, English is seen almost naturally as to be in the first additional language that you would want your young people to, to, to learn. So it is different within UK, it is different within Scotland, that we've got a variety of um, languages that, that schools historically have delivered. And in a sense, we have to kind of uh, start from where schools are. So interestingly, for example, some schools in the east of Scotland uh, uh, might offer German. Uh, as, uh, and, and French, and some parts of the west of, of Scotland it tends to be French and, and, and uh, Spanish, for example. So there's already a kind of a variety of languages on offer, but I think the point that, that, that Tim was, was making earlier on about how schools, what, what kind of image do schools project about, do they value the, all the languages that children bring to, to the school with them, do, do they engage parents in, in terms of the uh, mother tongue language and offer opportunities to um, parents in, in, in the school to engage. It's that kind of ethos that I think will make or, or lead young people more likely to have a, a disposition or a, an interest in languages so that in a sense it doesn't particularly matter what first language, first additional language they learn. I mean, it's generally recognised that if the, the, the more proficient you are with one language, the easier it is to learn another. So if we can encourage our young people to pick up on uh, a first additional language, it's, the chances are that they're going to go on to learn other languages as and when they, they see it appropriate for them or when they come to make uh, choices in, in terms of uh, you know, uh, life and work, they, they might go on to learn other languages then. So, so it's all about trying to encourage schools and authorities to think about the language strategy in the round and how do they draw on all, all the range of supports that are there already. Billy Coffey. 
Thanks very much, Convener. I wonder if I could ask for your thoughts on how we design the curriculum or whether we have to look at designing the curriculum to support this. Clearly, if this strategy works, it's going to push through from primary to secondary the demand for for youngsters to learn um, <coughs> modern languages, foreign languages and so on. And I'm thinking particularly of science and engineering students, perhaps. Um, is there an expectation amongst that group of youngsters, even at the moment, that they should be picking up modern and foreign languages? And is the, the curriculum, even at present, suitable enough to accommodate that? Because I, I do know one or two examples where it's been particularly difficult for youngsters uh, in my authority area to match up their choice of foreign languages with, for example, science subjects. So I would anticipate that that's going to be the case. And, and is there any thinking and planning to, to ensure that that will be a smooth process and to, to offer the children the, the choices that they actually want? I think you make a very, very, very valid point. I think our scientists, our engineers of the future are going to need to speak another language. We have scientists, um, engineers working here from all over the world and they bring with them opportunities, uh, 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 a knowledge of uh, their own mother tongue plus another language and perhaps they're working in English. The uh, representative from the employers group on the languages working group was talking about, um, it was a German company, a drilling company that um, was looking for someone to go and work in um, the Middle East. And the person who was going to get that job was a Libyan who could speak English and German. And so, you know, he, he was shoehorned in for the job. We want our engineers and scientists of the future to be able to have th this um, an, a knowledge of another language and also this disposition, this um, um, preparedness in life to learn another language. Um, so in, in terms of your, your, your point about uh, fitting this into the curriculum, I think this is where innovation is crucial because um, there, there, are, uh, there are schools who um, uh, provide exposure to other languages in, in very innovative ways, which we would like to see um, much more um, mainstreamed. For example, provision of PE. The John Ogilvie High School uh, provides PE lessons in Spanish. So young people have Spanish while they're doing their... So they, they, their language uh, skills will... Uh, 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 in Spanish will be uh, be around uh, numbers and exercises and things like that, but it, it, it is providing language in, in, in a curricular area that is, is new and innovative and it, again it, it reinforces the, the point that you know it, it, there's more to, to learning than just um, speaking your own um, en English mother tongue. Um, so Following from that, if young people start uh, to learn a second language from primary one and they move through into secondary, they'll be a much higher level when they start secondary. So um, they will probably um, not need as much uh, language learning in secondary as they do at the moment um, if they've only just started in primary six. So I would have hoped that through you know, planning, I know it's a lot more complicated than this, but through good planning that the engineers and the scientists um, and indeed the social uh, studies um, uh, students um, of, of the future will, be, will have that openness uh, to, to learning another language. And it's n we're not necessarily talking about absolute fluency here. It's about a broad um, uh, capability to be able to communicate uh, and then to take that on and to learn um, another language. Um, if for, for employment purposes to, to fluency, um, but hopefully there will be a lot of fluency and um, increased fluency um, achieved. I was just going to add to that that four of the pilot projects this year are, are looking at languages in the secondary uh, school, both within broad general education and also at the senior phase. So, so you, in some instances you may find that young people, when they come to make choices, perhaps go down the sciences route, but um, what we'd be keen to see is can we encourage young people to pick up languages later in, in, in the, the senior phase, even if it's not at a, a level of a higher. Um, there are lots of SQA awards for uh, work purposes or for, for life and work that um, young people could pick up in their, their sixth year, for example, to sit alongside perhaps uh, qualifications in, in, in sciences. But 
I think as Tim has suggested, the long-term impact of this policy we, we hope will be that when young people do come to secondary school, they will already have a, a kind of bank of uh, learning w w within languages that it will make it easier for them to pick up, um, you know, additional qualifications or, uh, you know, f further up the, the school. Thank Very much. I think we've got a final question from Claire. Yes, um, and you've partly answered it already. Um, if I could turn to your comments about Edinburgh University using their students. Um, I just wanted to ask about the Erasmus programme and whether we're using that to the best advantage. And I know the Scottish Government have just changed the funding rules for studying abroad so that they're now um, funding that on the same basis as studying in, in Scotland. Um, where it used to be based on, on what provision was in the, the country someone was studying in. So uh, do you think there's enough knowledge out there about the Erasmus programme and what can, can really be done to, to encourage more Scottish students to, to have a period studying abroad? Um, i just say that we're not responsible for uh, Erasmus in learning direction. It's a, it's a higher education um, responsibility. But um, I do um, think that, uh, that there it would be beneficial for better um, awareness of Erasmus. But I think um, part of the reason for the sort of uh, poor uptake for, by Scottish students in Erasmus is this uh, lack of, uh, of confidence in language skills, which will, in turn, when this policy is... is uh, if it, uh, when, it, when it's adopted and uh, implemented uh, to the, the, the wishes that we, we hope it will be, um, will result in a whole new cohort of, of uh, young people who are much more confident about using languages and keen to do so. So we will get you know, the scientists and engineers who, who are studying here um, w be keen to go to Germany or to, to France um, or indeed to China to actually spend a year uh, continuing their studies uh, in uh, um, an another country will with the and and, and bring back all the the, the language um, um, uh, advantages that they will acquire through that. That will be a, a wonderful um, career um, addition to their their CV. So I think um, it's, it's part of a, this is a, a chicken and egg situation. How do you get the demand? Uh, for those kinds of places without the language skills. What the, the government are trying to do here is to break that cycle and to, to um, by starting learning another language in, in primary one, to change whole attitudes to languages and to bring a whole new um, a cohort of, of, of young people to be much more aware and skilled in languages. Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate the answer. Um, are there enough teachers involved in Erasmus in Scotland, do you think? And uh, en enough of those going through the teaching qualification process? And is there opportunities there for, for, for study abroad? Um, for well, primary yeah, and secondary teachers in training? Um, I think, again, it's about uh, changing attitudes. And um, teachers would, would perhaps see the, the opportunities available. Um, or, or at, the, at the moment, um, the Scottish Government fund the British Council to arrange opportunities for, for um, or English language assistance. So all um, uh, undergraduates uh, studying a language here, uh, their third year is spent in, in a foreign, la uh, foreign country. Um, and the, the converse of that is that the foreign language assistance, uh, um, stu students um, studying English, um, in another uh, country are able to come here um, and that has also been picked up in, in the languages group report. The, the imbalance between incoming uh, foreign language assistance and outgoing English language assistance is, is, is completely out of kilter. We have many more uh, English language assistance going abroad than we do have uh, foreign language assistance coming in and uh, 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 we, we hope that that can be addressed through local authorities being um, or seeing the opportunities to employ um, foreign language assistance, the very cheap way of employing foreign, um, getting a native speaker to come here. And if I, I can also make the point I think Dr. Allen made in the debate last May, that the four million pounds that has been earmarked for next year, if local authorities were to use that simply for foreign language assistance, that would provide. Um, uh, enough funding for 500 
foreign language assistants to come in to work in Scottish schools, compare that to the 71 that we have at the moment, you can see the impact of that kind of, of initiative. OK, um, I think we're, we're really pushed for time. Rod, I think... Yeah, I'm you leave it, don't worry. Short, short on time. OK, yeah. okay. can I thank you for, for coming along? And there, there, no doubt, again, we could have had much, much more uh, time uh, to have uh, explore some of the avenues. Um, so we may come back to you on some of the, the issues that we, we have uh, brought up in the meeting. But thank, thank you very much. So a very quick two-minute comfort break, if members need it. And we are changing over for our next witness. Okay. Agenda item two this morning is um, consideration of paper on the UK Government and EU Consular Procedures for presiding support to families affected by bereavement of citizens abroad. Um, the information has been compiled following a request made by our colleague Bob Doris, MSP, that the committee seek an update on the UK Government's current processes for dealing with this issue. Can I welcome Bob along to the committee today? We're delighted to have you here. Um, and I think you've got some comments to make on the back of um, your your request. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Convener, uh, and I'm delighted to be here today, and thank you for doing some initial uh, preparatory work uh, uh, on behalf of the committee. Um, very brief context to, to why this is of, a, is of constituency interest to me. A few years ago, a constituent had a son die in Venezuela. Uh, the support provided to my constituent, Julie Love, and her family when Colin passed away it was unsatisfactory, uh, whether it was the Foreign Commonwealth Office, whether it was local authorities, whether it was uh, support services in Scotland, th th there was a need for improvement. Um, now, I've done a, a lot of work in relation to how we've improved that, and things are improving, but uh, there was a feeling that uh, the, the first stop in having a more consistent level of support for families when people uh, pass away uh, in other countries would be at a European level, given the the institution of the European Union. Now, uh, following writing to yourself, convener, uh, uh, I've since met with Victim Support Scotland, I've met with Strathclyde Police, I've met with the Lord Advocate, I've met with a number of bodies 
in relation to this. And one of the things that flagged up in my radar is by 2015 there's to be a European Victims Directive at a, at a European level to have more consistency in the support that's provided. That's certainly something that I'm keen to see. So it's not just a case of I'm representing a constituent and I've got a number of constituents, not just mine, but across Scotland, who've been drawn to my attention via the formation of a group called Death Abroad, You're Not Alone, which is a new support group set up in Scotland for those whose families uh, have experienced uh, relatives um, dying overseas. But the, the intention is to make sure that we have a consistency of approach, so it's not about a Scot dying in Germany, it's about a, a German dying in Scotland, dying in Spain, dying in France, and that consistent quality of support via European Victim Support Network and other authorities. And I'd be very keen, convener, for the, the European Committee to maybe give cognizance of this, get some more information on the European uh, Victims Directive 2015. I certainly know I'll be following it and be keen to make representations, perhaps via this committee, convener, about how we can improve the situation in relation to that. Okay, uh, thanks very, very much for that, Bob. The, the, back, the background is always uh, very uh, uh, helpful for putting things in context. Members will see that we do have um, a paper provided by SPICE where we did some investigations, um, and I would just uh, invite members to, to, to make any comments or ask uh, Bob any questions. Helen. I thank uh, Bob Doris for uh, this paper and, and the information that we have received and congratulate him on this work. I mean, I too have been uh, affected by a constituent uh, in this regard. Their son died in Thailand from an accident and it was a major trauma for everyone concerned. And you're right, there was uh, real uh, problems in trying to get the body repatriated. And in the end, it boiled down to the fact that the family had to have a cremation first in order to keep the cost from £17,000 down to £8,000. But you can imagine getting £8,000 for a very, uh, you know, two pensioners um, was a huge uh, issue for them. And in the end, uh, we managed locally to raise the funds for them. Uh, but it was very obvious to me, helping that family, just how um, pertinent the points that you're making are and that there is a need because I noticed in the SPICE papers that we've received this morning that in Denmark, for example, there seems to be a very good approach in Denmark in that uh, they will provide um, support uh, to, to, to repatriate the body and it is uh, outstanding that that's the only country that it seems to have that uh, type of uh, facility now. Um, not everyone has insurance, and that's another message that we need to get out there to people, the travelling members of the public, is to um, really uh, work through the small print of their insurance policies and try to uh, help see how we can promote that. But I do welcome the establishment of this organisation that you have spoken about. I think uh, we as a parliament should do what we can to support that sort of initiative. I think it's very important because it's all very well for us to say it's a reserve matter to Westminster's Foreign Commonwealth Office. If we all care, then the bottom line is that we have to make sure that the best support is in place to try to support these individuals and not leave uh, either the families or the MSPs and others supporting them to paddle their own boats. That's that's not the way forward. The best thing to do is get the maximum help and support. So I, I, I would certainly support further work by this committee to see um, what we can do to be of assistance. Thank, thanks, Helen. Bob, do you want to come back on any of that? Just very, very briefly, I, I, I think you, you mentioned reserve matters. There's, there, there's significant devolved matters at play here as well. For example, there's no consistency in terms of how police deliver a death message across Scotland. Perhaps that's something that will improve with a, a national police force. And there's no consistency in terms of when police refer to Victim Support Scotland to support families. There's just two examples at a devolved setting about how we... I have to say the police are looking at improving that because I've been in discussions with them. But there's just two examples of where this committee may decide that actually that there is, there's devolved matters at play here as well. Good, Jimmy. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you a question, Bob, on um, the insurance thing that was mentioned by um, um, Helen. Um, it, most people, I mean, uh, well, so far as I know, most people do take insurance when they go on, uh, certainly go on holiday or go on board. I mean, are the insurances, do you know what the position is? W w do they not, do they really not cover? Um, are people being conned 
in this instance, that, that, that you know, they think they're safe and all, all these things are taken care of, and in fact they're not? I think there's... Well, I would need to get more information on that myself, Mr McGregor, to be honest, but there, there's two different ways of looking at it. Sometimes people are travelling overseas, sometimes it's Scots who have made their life overseas for a period of time and therefore wouldn't have that travel insurance and the family would still... I, I know of a, a personal friend, and I won't give the details, who eventually decided on uh, a cremation uh, in France because of the expense of storing the body in France and then raising the funds to get the, the body returned to Scotland. That's not the kind of choice anyone should be faced with, certainly at a European Union level anyway. And one suggestion I've made, and I'm, I'm taking it forward, is perhaps the travel industry does have a a role to play here. We've all seen examples of when you go online to book flights and there's a click box to donate £2 to this or £1 to that. Perhaps the travel industry has a role in how they can help uh, fund uh, you know, families in these terrible situations. So travel insurance is a key responsibility, of course, Mr McGregor, but the families, uh, for those who don't out travel insurance, obviously shouldn't be punished uh, or suffer because of the choice made by, by individual travellers as well. I mean, I think the point yeah. you're making is a very important one. Don't get me wrong at all. I think it is important, and I, I would agree with Helen that we should look into it. But I, ju I, ju I just wanted to get the facts about insurance straight. That's all. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, um, Jim is quite right in terms of responsibility for people to have insurance. But what we need to appreciate is there are many insurance companies, in fact, there are many countries where you're not even insured. So that's one element. We've got 150 or different nationalities living in Scotland today. And when they travel overseas to visit family and friends or even for business, insurance companies won't simply will not insure them while they're out there. So that's one, one issue. The other issue about insurance policies is they play safe. So they'll say to you, what issues do you have with you, like diabetes, blood pressure, heart condition, kidneys, whatever. And then they say, well, we won't cover you for those. So I don't know what they are covering you for because they're taking money from you, but they're not actually covering you for the issues that you may have a problem with. So that's another issue in, in terms of insurance policy, insurance companies, that they are, in fact, quite selfish in actually reducing the cover on you. They find ways of actually not paying out. And a lot of people, unfortunately, get caught out in that who do not see the small print, get the insurance, go out, have an issue, and then the insurance company says, ah, you didn't tell us about this, so we're not covering you. And the families are left to pick up the tab. And I think that's another element. But the most important element in all of this is the human dimension in this. The human dimension is that when our people go overseas, they need to know, or the families need to know, that if there is an issue, our government will step in and support them. And I think that's a very important element in all of this. And this is why I'm very, I'm particularly keen to support the bill is because it takes that fear and it takes that burden away from families so that we have a proper structure in dealing with this. And I know there will be complications in terms of people will say if, if bodies are coming from overseas, uh, who's going to examine them? Are they, being, are they carrying any diseases? and so on and so forth. There are issues, but I think they're all doable. We can deal with them. It's just a matter of actually sitting down and actually going through it. So I would recommend very strongly, Chair, that this committee continues to support this bill and try to find ways of accommodating it. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Helen, did you want to come in on a specific yeah, so point? On yeah. the insurance issue, I mean, yeah. I think maybe one of the things we could do is write to the British Insurers Association. I mean, I think it's something that I know on BBC uh, in the past week, there was Gloria Hannaford was on the TV and she was highlighting the issue about uh, how APTA travel insurance is invalidated if you uh, book online, which many of us do nowadays, if you book uh, your packages for, uh, sorry, if you book your flight separate from your accommodation where you're abroad, if you're not booking an actual package, then you're not covered by APTA insurance. So, I mean, I think that that's the type of detail um, that the man or woman in the street might not necessarily pick up and all of that. And, and it's only when, um, you know, they're really confronted by the dilemmas that Bob's constituent and my constituent's been affected by, that you really get into it and you understand that. So I would suggest maybe an approach to British Insurance Association just to ask them if they could uh, comment or come and speak to us about it. I mean, that's maybe something else. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Willie? 
Thanks very much, convener, and just to thank Bob Doris for bringing this matter to the committee's attention. It's not a subject that I had particular knowledge about. Um, only to add to the discussion, convener, that if a person also died in the journey, making a journey from one country to the other, I've had some experience of constituents who fell into that category and where the responsibilities would lie in those cases. And I would hope that as part of the, this victim's directive that you mentioned, Bob, that there may be some consideration given to that too, so that it's clear and it's consistent and, and that people don't have the kind of worries that your constituents and other members' constituents have had to face. Next, Willie. Rod. Um, uh, morning, Mr. Doris. Just a couple of points. Um, the, there is a victim's bill which is shortly going to be going through the Justice Committee. Uh, I'm would have thought that we would be trying to ensure that the bill, as far as possible, is going to uh, reflect the the e EC directive. So I don't know if there's a possibility for you to kind of engage with uh, the Justice Committee on these kind of issues. Um, secondly, obviously, um, in certain circumstances where it's a fatal accident, the Scottish Government is committed, I think, to introducing legislation in this Parliament to allow fatal accident inquiries to take place in Scotland where deaths occur abroad, which isn't the current position. So, um, so there's just a couple of, kind of tweaks, but I, th I think you raise a, an important issue. Grant, you've brought it to our attention. Oh. Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Just briefly, in relation to, to, to Mr Campbell, yes, I'm delighted the Scottish Government's going to legislate to, to lift the bar on fatal accident inquiries into uh, deaths overseas. That was actually based on the intervention of my constituent, Julia Love, and myself to Lord Cullen, who was doing the, the inquiry in relation to that. So I'm delighted the Scottish Government has listened. I, I think I would make one... Thank you, first of all, for the sub general support from the committee. It is very much appreciated. I, I suppose I would make a, a general point that because the initial discussion was about repatriating of, 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 of a loved one's bodies, I, I should stress that uh, other dimensions, such as when the police appoint family liaison officers in sudden or unexplained deaths, the contesting for when a family feels there is a sudden and unexplained death, but the authorities in the country by in which the person died don't agree, the back channels that both the Foreign Commonwealth Office and the police can use a light has to be shown on that. So it is, it, it is, a, it is a wider issue uh, and at a European level with the European directive on the horizon. That was one of the reasons I thought it might be of, of interest to this committee. Just finally, can I draw attention to the committee that, uh, and I hope I've got the dates right here, I was checking over some notes I had with a meeting with Victim Support Scotland just before Christmas, but uh, Victim Support Europe are holding a conference in Edinburgh between the 29th and the 31st of May this year. Uh, to explore issues in relation to this further, and that's certainly something if I can attend, I will be attending. It's something the committee <coughs> may wish, to, may wish to, to show an interest in whenever you, you decide on a future work plan, of, of course. But on a, on a personal level, I'll be continuing with this, but I just think given the, the very human nature and the very obvious nature of the European Union providing an excellent platform. We see here so many negative things wrongly about the European Union at present, but this is surely an example of the European Union having a, 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 an exceptional role to play in supporting citizens across Europe at a time of, of, of incredible need, and this committee may wish to follow that story. Yeah, um, thanks for that. I think Ian's going to come in and tell us a wee bit about the directive that, that you mentioned, Bob. Well, Yes, the EU Victims Directive might not be uh, quite as useful as you think because the full title is the EU uh, Victims of Crime Directive. So it wouldn't cover those who were, whose deaths resulted from natural causes abroad. It would only cover those who were affected by crime. So in some respects, it might be worthwhile me looking further into this when I go back out to Brussels to see exactly what the scope of the directive would be with regards the criminal aspect, and then see if there's any proposals at all for the wider picture regarding uh, natural uh, death by natural causes. Uh, it might also be worthwhile me bringing back some more information on what the EU uh, sees as a good practice model. Uh, there is some work being done just now in terms of the consular support services out in Brussels, and it might be worthwhile seeing if this is an issue which is being discussed actively at an EU level and see if more information can be coming back. So, convener, it might be useful for me to prepare a short paper uh, drawing the strands of the discussion today, including the various letters that we will write and information we draw back and bring it to this committee as soon as that's available. And again, we can have a further discussion. 
we, we, I mean, I think in this case, some of this has to be sort of a baby steps rather than giant steps because it seems to be different different avenues. So, I mean, I don't know how members feel about Ian taking forward that piece of work and then bringing it back at a later date for further discussion. And if there's anything, you know, that you feel, because I know that you've got your own actions that you're taking, um, and and it, it, that would be great if you keep us informed about how how that that's going. But is that does that seem like a reasonable step for the next step forward? I mean, it certainly does, and it is, of course, for the committee uh, to decide in your own your own work plan and your own way forward. And I, I thank you for the quite extensive engagement you're having with me in terms of my involvement in, in plotting that out. I think that would be an excellent idea. Uh, and I, I'm disappointed to hear the directive may not be what I was hoping it would be, but perhaps one of the outcomes from today was we could uh, expand the remit of that directive. Wouldn't it be something of this committee... And, and ourselves actually helped instigate a direction of travel at a European Union level which improved uh, the lives of families across the European Union. Well, I mean, I the, the process of, of directives you know, at, at, at an early stage and whether you know, two years away from it being brought in is an early stage. It might not be in European <laughs> Union terms. That might be a very late stage and it was an early stage was five years ago. Um, but maybe um, Ian can shed some light on that for... for I can. It's actually quite a late stage. The, the expectation is that this will be finalised in the coming months because the, the present Commission deem its office in May 2014, so they are quite far beyond. However, the next Commission coming in in 2014 will have to set out its own work programme at that point. And this may well be an issue which they would adopt as they begin to look at their own work programme for their five-year term of office. So in terms of uh, amending this particular directive, it's not an impossibility, but it might not be in parallel with the scope of the directive. That being said, the European Parliament will be a place again where this can be explored more thoroughly. After 2014, again, the next Commission may well be able to take this issue forward. I think there's a few opportunities there in, in how we can you know, take, take some of this, the steps forward. I think, for, for our point of view, maybe bringing the, the information that Ian will, will gather. Hans Ayla. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the speed that this is going to be taking. And it's, it sounds rather slow to me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that uh, the direction needs to be uh, multifunctional. So we need, to be sev we need to be doing several things simultaneously rather than taking one step at a time. Because this is a, this is a, this is a wonderful opportunity for this parliament to put something in place for our community. And um, Bob's had the vision of bringing it forward. He's, he's had the experience that his constituents have faced, and he's made us aware of that fact. It is now up to us to support him to make sure that we deliver this sooner rather than later. And therefore, I think that we need to be proactive in this, and I think we need to be contacting the European Union sooner rather than later. Let's not wait till the next session. Let's get on with it. If they decide to pass it on to the next session, that's their prerogative, but we should not hold it back. So I think we should just try to push this the boundary a little <coughs> faster so that not many other communities face the same difficult times as constituents already do. Okay, I mean, I think there's, a, there's bits of information there. There's, there's an opportunity for a committee inquiry as far as police consistency, the travel industry, insurance, all of that. Uh, very much so. The other bit is is the European yes. Directive. Um, when are you next in Brussels, Ian? <laughs> next in Brussels at the end of the month. I can certainly have early discussions at that point. So, um, yeah. I, the one thing I will say is that we can move very fast. The European Union moves very slow, but that's not a reason for not doing it very fast. Helen, what, what about kind of interaction with the UK government? Bear in mind that it is a reserve matter. Yes, I mean, I, I think the early engagement I would have is to see exactly what, this, what the avenues are to take it forward. So the first step will be how do we do it, where would we go, how would it happen, and I will come back with that information. You're quite right, the UK government is a member of state, they would have to be active in support of this. Yeah, thanks very much, convenient. I think I've read somewhere in the papers, the sea of papers that we've had, that there's um, some inquiries with being made with the councillors in Scotland. I don't remember if it's Bob that's doing that or whether it's our committee clerks that are doing it, but somebody I think is doing that. But I think that if, if it identifies that there's a problem across the other nations uh, in the EU, then maybe what we need to also ask the councillors whilst we're doing that is um, what support 
voluntary organisations are there in the other member states that we could link up with? Because maybe a network, a, a networking approach might also be a useful way forward because if they share the same concerns, then even if it's not on anyone's radar just now, the question then is how do we then get that on to people uh, into a directive and get the Commission to think about bringing a directive forward, even although there's not one at the moment, because I think this would be one uh, that would command support across the EU, I feel sure. No doubt, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Victim Support Europe are the people pushing for the directive? Is that right? Well, the victim Support Scotland that were uh, informing me about it. So I think I, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that is the case. Convener, yes. Okay. Is, is, it, is that plan yep. action? Does that meet with what we need? I think we need we need the detailed information yes. about the directive and, and the European dimension and our engagement with the UK government to take that forward. Um, and at that stage, then we can have a, a discussion about how we want to deal with. Police consistency, travel industry, insurance. Bob, do you get some final comments? General time, yep. time is sensitive for, for you this morning again. I won't get into the detail of what you said there because it's for your committee to, to quite reasonably decide your, your, your course of action. But in terms of the reserved nature of, of this, I would point out that when I was on the Local Government and, and Communities Committee, we had a visit out to Brussels, and one of the things that we found out, and Mr McIver, when we were out there, one of the things we found out is Europe were very surprised that committees of this Parliament don't more often, as other nations and regions do, make direct representations to them, and they were encouraging us to do, encouraging us to do it far more. So I think that that's an important thing to put on the record. And secondly, in, in Ms Cedi's point in terms of, of networking, I very much appreciate... Uh, uh, the clerks of this committee contacting various European consulates in Edinburgh. One of the things I was minded to do, and I haven't done it, but I'd be happy to do it in conjunction with the European Committee you so chose, was to perhaps have a, an event in this Parliament, uh, a networking event, Ms. Cedi, I have to say, in terms of uh, putting the human face to the experiences that the various consulates have had, because at the end of the day, no country, including Scotland, likes other nations saying, what you're doing is not good enough. This is about working in partnership together yeah. and getting a degree of consensus. And if we're looking to that degree of consensus across Europe, I think the consulate network in Edinburgh would be an excellent place to start. And I'm keen to do that. And if the, the committee wished to do something in partnership, I'd be, be happy to, to do that. I think the committee, given its work programme over the next few months, would be very keen to have you do some of that work um, and inform, <laughs> <laughs> inform uh, the, the whole process. That would be very helpful. OK, That's thank you. <laughs> we will. Thanks very, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to agenda item three, which is Brussels Bulletin. Now, we are really, really pushed for time now, so Ian has said he will be very quick. So if you've got questions, please get them in very, very quickly to Ian about the Brussels Bulletin. I'm just going to do a couple of things. It's all in here. The big thing, I think, worth noting, the EU <coughs> budget for the coming year has been passed. So there were some discussions you might remember about failure to do so affecting the various funding programmes. I want to just draw your attention to the comments from the EU Budget Commissioner. There's a serious risk that we will run out of funds early in the course of next year. Um, I am concerned that by systematically cutting the Commission's estimates, the Council transforms the EU annual budget in a budget for nine to ten months. Last year we ran out of cash to pay all the claims in November, this year it was October, and next year I expect this will happen even earlier. So something to bear in mind there. Uh, CAP, uh, sorry, um, CFP negotiations are ongoing, but the fishery, fishing quota negotiations of December have taken place. I want to draw your attention, I know the Deputy Convener has been very interested in the mackerel issue. That's not yet been resolved, and the quotas for that have not yet been set. These are set as a bilateral between the EU and Norway. All the stocks of the North Sea are yet to be set because of the mackerel issue not being resolved. The mackerel stocks have not been set, nor have the herring stocks. So that discussion should take place in January, but as you can see, Progress has been very slow on that. Final thing, again, the cigarette packaging. Worthwhile noting, again, the original plans to have no advert, uh, sorry, no fancy packages, but just brown packages has been um, set aside. So there will be large health warnings, but there will not be complete brown papered packages. And there's a ban, or proposed to ban, um, flavoured cigarettes, so menthol cigarettes will be banned outright. Um, in terms of funding for renewables projects, Scotland has been successful. Two projects have received money, um, one again uh, out in the uh, Sound of Isla and the other one in the uh, Kyle Rhea area. So again, that's been very successful. I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to take 
Oh, just one final thing. What's worth noting again, the 21st of December, the, uh, the gender issue in terms of insurance finally came into play. So you might well find in your post bags both men and women complaining in different directions, no doubt, about uh, the increase in the cost of their insurance policies. Jimmy. Uh, the, the fact that we now have the budget figure, does that mean that we've got the budget figure for the CAP? No, it doesn't, uh, Jimmy. What this means is that we've got the budget for only this year, the year 2013. The big discussions for the multi-annual financial framework, which covers 2014 to 2020, have not yet been resolved. That will give us the figure for the CAP and the other things. What it does mean, however, is that um, the Parliament and Council seem willing to compromise uh, on this year's budget. It may well be a, a good sign for the negotiations over the bigger uh, financial framework. Might be, might not be, but might be. What? Um, uh, a useful marker on the European Year of the Citizens, but you'd be following up with a bit more detail of what's actually going to be happening this year. It's yes, I can. I mean, yeah. The European Year of Citizens, of course, uh, is an EU-wide idea, but the member state has to basically say what it's up to, what it's yeah. intending to do. So it might be useful for me to give you a small note on what the UK and the Scottish governments are intending to do as a, yeah. to mark the, the Year of Citizens. That would be helpful. Yeah. Thanks. Oh. Thank you, Chair. In terms of macro and Iceland's involvement in fishing <laughs> macros that we helped yeah. build reserves for, um, what action, if any, are we taking? Is, is it a possibility of a, a ban of imports of fish from Iceland because of that, or well, no? So you're, you're quite right to raise this again. You will recall that when we spoke about this the last time, the, the discussions of a ban on various aspects were imminent. The ban has run into the ground on this, primarily because the imports affect employment inside the EU for the processing of the mackerel. So this issue has therefore become a little bit more complicated than one might have liked. So at the moment that is still ongoing. What they're hoping, and I think it's a slightly forlorn hope, is that these negotiations will resolve the issues in, just in January. I'll provide more information when I come back from Brussels. I'm not overly optimistic they can resolve, and that may lead to questions about the quotas for the North Sea, but mm. the Icelandic issue is the one that's got to be um, lanced. How, how can we engage to try to ensure that there is some sort of repents by yeah. the Icelandic government in, in, in that issue. This might be worthwhile me having informal discussions, I think, with the Scottish government to see where they stand on this, because I know that the UK government has a lot of the, the has expressed concerns for employment issues, and I would like to find out a bit more about where Scotland stands on that as well. Mm. If I can find that out, I can bring it back and see exactly what Scottish and UK governments intend to do to try and bring this issue to resolution. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, it. Okay, convener, thanks. The carbon capture and storage announcement there in the, the new funding for that. How how is that made known to Scottish companies and so on that there's an opportunity to get some funding there? You might remember that the Longanet plant in Scotland was up for funding, but for various reasons didn't secure it. Yeah. Um, I think what's interesting here is that the money was intended to go to. Uh, a large French operation, but in the end it fell through because it simply wasn't able to, to, to hit the criteria that were going to be justifications for securing the money. Mm -hmm. So no money was spent on carbon capture and storage, which was surprising. The Scottish Government, I think, will be pushing very hard uh, in the next uh, cycle of this to get money for Long Gannett. Again, it should be more evolved in this particular. I'm assuming this will be the case, but um, Long Gannett will be further along in terms of the process. So I think the Scottish Government are very active now, both in terms of discussions with the energy companies, the stakeholders who have the potential facilities, uh, to encourage them to be uh, ready for these particular um, funding streams. It's a lot of money. Uh, we'll it is a lot of money. We'll be fully aware that these announcements have been yes. made. Yes, oh, I'm, I'm absolutely certain okay. we'll be fully aware of that. Yeah. Okay. OK, committee content to send the Brussels bulletin to our other committees for... Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item four, which is our exploration of the range of EU funds available. Um, we have a paper um, which goes into some detail. So, <laughs> um, yeah, if, if, if Ian can give us a, a brief uh, overview, there's one area of concern that certainly I've picked up in the paper, and I think Ian will maybe mention that anyway. Yeah. The paper is an excellent paper uh, produced by Ian McKeever and Spice. It is quite a mammoth task, as you'll have discovered. What seemed to be uh, initially uh, 
Uh, what, what seemed to be initially an easy question to ask actually has proven to be quite a hard one to answer. So what I think is useful here is the table at the back just allows you to scan down uh, the various funds. And, and, and what Ian has helpfully done here is it gives you the fund, what the fund is meant to do, how the funds are allocated, the overall EU budget available to the whole of the EU, and then how much Scotland has drawn down. A couple of things I just want to emphasise here. There are two sorts of um, streams within it. One is what I'm going to term pre-allocated. And this basically means that you have a situation where the negotiations on the multi-annual financial framework take place, the budget heads are set, and that is the amount of money which the UK and Scotland gets. And that covers things like um, structural funds. It covers things like common agricultural policy. The more interesting funds, and I think the ones that the, this committee were touching on, were those which are large pots of money which Scottish organisations, Scottish bodies could draw down if they were successful. But they're competitive funds, so they have to be secured in open competition across the whole of the EU. Important to note, again, that match funding is a key part in that. If you haven't got the funds to, to, get, in the, to get into the round, you're not going to have a great success in drawing down the monies, which is important to note. The point, I think, which is... Um, worthwhile drawing attention, and the conveners alluded to this, is as you scan down the Scottish drawdown, you'll see that there's a number of occasions when simply the figures are just simply unknown. And I think that's an interesting thing to, to have. There are reasons which were given for that, and, and they include the fact a lot of these drawdowns are not the Scottish Government drawing down the money, but rather the organisations, and therefore they're not, the Government is less aware of that. But I'm, I'm still sure that somebody somewhere must have a book that says this is what Scotland has drawn down in order to know whether Scotland is or is not a net recipient of funds. Mm. Somebody has to know it. Now, the EU will know it, but you would kind of hope that somebody closer to home would know it as well. So one of the recommendations in the paper is that we perhaps ask that question. Ask you. Somebody somewhere must have this information. The second thing I think which I'm, I'm suggesting is that this is, if you like, what's going on now. This is at the, up until 2014, the end of the current funding cycle. The next funding cycle will be important as well, and I think we should ask the Scottish Government where things stand there. So how successful are they being in securing the big budget heads so for CAP, as Jamie was raising earlier, and uh, structural funds and so on. That negotiation is ongoing. An update on that would be no bad thing. Other committees will be interested in this, so I'm suggesting we circulate it around. And I think this committee should think about what it wants to do once we've got more information from the government about these other funds. Helen. I just want to congratulate Ian McKeever as well. I think it's an exceptionally good paper and it was really um, you know, a huge uh, undertaking for him, but also for us to read our way through it as well. But it's fantastic and I think it is important <coughs> to share it with other colleagues across the Parliament. I think all MSPs should have sight of this document. And I, I also agree with the recommendations. I do think that it is um, very concerning um, and there may be good explanations, as Ian um, Duncan has said, for us not uh, having the information, but I really think it's very important that we do get that information. We either get it from the Scottish Government or we have to go to Brussels to get it. We don't physically go to Brussels, but we ask Brussels for the information because I think it's vital because, do you know, some of these figures that we're talking about here are bigger than the whole of this, the Scottish Government's budget alone that we could draw down funding from and grow the budget. And I think that that's something that, you know, in terms of, we're talking about shovel-ready projects and all the rest of it, there's possibilities of getting more money if people really worked much harder and if the Scottish Government just really put a, a, an absolute highest priority of going to get all of this money that can be drawn down. Because I realise there's a fixed pot of money, but there's a drawdown money for the research. That's separate from, and that's what we have to focus on, I think, as a committee. Yeah, I think uh, you're absolutely right, Helen. I think if we send it to all the committees, then at least all uh, MSPs will get, get a sight of it anyway. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that one. Uh, it did concern me about the unknowns. One of the other places where some of the unknown money will be will be at local authority level. Mm -hmm. Certainly the match funded project that I ran, the money came through the local authority and not through any government. So it came direct from the from Brussels to the local authority. So there's maybe an avenues there to, to, to gather some of that, that information. The, the other thing that, that crossed my mind was um, if you remember back when we took some evidence, it might have been on the multi-annual financial framework, we had um, some people in the sector saying that there should be some sort of a central government strategy, basically, an, an agency within, you know, one of the directorates at government that actually, you know, communicates and uh, actively seeks out additional funding and then and then dis distributes that. Um, and that may be something that we could, we could follow up at a later date. Yeah. Any other comments, Jimmy? Well, just that um, 
uh, I noticed from Ian's, um, you know, from the Brussels Bulletin, that there was somebody in there saying that, you know, they're complaining that the budget wasn't big enough and that, in fact, they'd run out of money two years ago in November and that last year they'd run out in October. And this year he was suggesting we're going to run out even earlier than that. And does that affect, these? that presumably affects all of these, these grants, doesn't it? It affects some more than others. Certainly, yeah. you might remember that, uh, for example, the, um, one of the big impacts of a failure to secure this budget was the Erasmus money, which would have been uh, immediately... Well, I noticed in that, that was another thing. I noticed that there was an extra six billion had been dedicated for, yes. for that. Well, that I don't know that particular project, but it was to research and development. Yeah. Uh, in your bulletin, it said that. Yeah. But I, I imagine that was for the Erasmus project. Yes, I mean, they, they had to try and find other sources of money. The problem always is, and you'll, you'll find this as a frustration that, that almost everyone has in Brussels, is that they, they make all these commitments, but they're almost, if you like, unfunded commitments. And then the member states come along and say, we don't put that money in. And so you end up with high level commitments and low level funding. So there's always a discrepancy between the two. And that, that causes the very problems which we're witnessing now. Yeah. yeah, but the, 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 there's no doubt that they, they don't like running out of money you know, before the end of the year for obvious reasons. Projects can't be completed. Okay, yeah. happy to take... Willie, sorry, Willie. Thanks very much, Convener. Just uh, in support of everything that's been said so far, um, just to, to make the point, that how do organisations, if organisations are, are eligible to apply for these funds, how are they all made known to various organisations in Scotland? For example... European Partnership for Sport is three and a half million euros, I presume, available there to tackle things like the fight against match fixing. Now that might not be applicable in Scotland. Oh. <laughs> we don't, we don't <laughs> know. <laughs> but how do the, the general point is how do organisations how are they made aware that these funds are there and they can apply for them? And is that part of the remit of either the UK government or the Scottish government? That's a very good question. I think that's what the convener was touching upon, which is there are lots of funds, but if you don't know they exist, how can you, how can you prepare to draw down the money? And the sports one is fascinating to read what you could get funding for. I'm not quite sure who would be the person to draw down the money in that instance. But I think it may be something we want to put to the Scottish Government about you know, how, what strategies do they have to make potential recipients aware of the sources of funding at an EU level and, 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 what's, and what support could be offered to them to help them engage with it. OK, are we happy with the recommendations that we will contact the Scottish Government, get an update on the multi-annual financial framework and um, get an update on the, some of the other comments? Circulate the paper to the subject committees. Once we've got that, we can agree an approach. Happy with that? Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much. You know, for the next item, a parliamentary question fairly high up on the agenda, I think it is. Will we be finished in time? To we will be. Okay. We will be. <laughs> we have to be. Mm. We're, we're not allowed to sit. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really uh, conscious of the time. So uh, very quickly, agenda item five is our foreign language learning and primary schools inquiry, and it's a brief report that I, I think Jenny has put together. Do you want to see anything quickly, Jenny? Jenny? Uh, I'm just very aware of the, the time, and obviously Helen needs to get away as well. Um, just really, it was just really to highlight the main points. I won't go through them, but. Um, I think we kind of covered some of them in the evidence as well yeah. in terms of you know the, the engagement of parents and teachers uh, and also on the funding issue as well um, and it also touches on the, the qualification issues as well towards the end of page one so um, and Hansala and Christina attended obviously so they could take questions I suppose if yeah. they were. When it was it was an excellent morning we were certainly um Impressed. Impressed is probably too light a word to use, and, and, and the skills, the motiv motivation, and the understanding of the kids, the parents, and the teachers. Um, and the key aspect of that was the leadership of the head teacher. And if you could capture what she had and put it in a bottle and administer it to every head teacher across the land, then we would certainly be in a, in a good place. Do you agree with that, Hansel? Yes, but I think um, most head teachers probably would reflect uh, and and duplicate that feeling. I, I, I genuinely felt that our, our school staff have historically faced very difficult challenges and this, they seem to do better and better and better year on year on year. And I was, I, I was absolutely impressed with the, the level of commitment of staff and pupils and parents. And I hope and pray that we can replicate that across Scotland because I think we deserve it and our kids deserve it. Okay, obviously we're continuing on with our inquiry, so can we note that report 
and incorporate its findings into the, the final report. The next meeting will be the 24th of January. Um, so we'll be delighted to see there. We'll have some academics and we will take forward the issue on the Human Trafficking Directive too. If I can remind members that the meeting with the Canadian delegation has been shifted from 2.15 to 3.15 because their timetable changed. Um, there was an email sent out yesterday, so if you could let the clerks know about that if you wish to attend. And we will see you in the 24th. Helen, sorry. Just, just ask one question. I believe you've got the Bulgarian ambassador coming soon as well. Is it possible to be included in that meeting? And yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. I didn't think you would miss that opportunity, actually. <laughs> well, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen anything on my email. Oh, right, right, right. And I apologise to Jenny. I will get back to you about the school's visit. So. Okay, the UK IRO thing. Does that not go to all members? Yeah. Did it? So, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I missed it. We'll have a look. But a bit when, okay. when, when was the Canadian thing? The 24th. Uh, and uh, what's it been moved from when? 2.15 to 3.15. Okay, Helen, you better get off of the chamber. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you Jim. Thanks. Was the meeting?